Can we get back to the agenda? Starting with the public hearings. The P1 board of the plan is actually approved for item P1. Yes, item P1 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on July 1st, 2020. Good afternoon, Justin Ressler, Assistant Solid Waste Director. P1 is an ordinance amending Chapter 90 of the Pasco County Code of Ordinances, Article 2, Solid Waste Collection and Disposal, Divisions 1, 2, 1 and 2, all sections, and Article 3, Disposal Fees and Charges, Division 1, Sections 90-91, 90-93, and Division 2, Sections 90 through 116, providing for repealer, providing for severability, providing for applicability, providing for inclusion in code, providing an effective date. Next slide, please. So this is the ordinance that was previously introduced at the June 2nd meeting. And really, this ordinance is, is primarily designed to provide some more direction to our haulers, so setting out some more service standards and some specific violations uh, for repeated occurrences like missed pickup or, or damaged uh, equipment in people's homes. Um, we've also added a few things in, again, mandating commercial recycling to be provided in those areas where it is currently not. Um, and we did prevent a hauler meeting back in January, and, and we did allow for some space to receive feedback from the haulers when the ordinance was initially introduced. I'll go ahead, next slide. Um, really, again, this is to, to provide some direction, and, and we do have a good working relationship with our haulers. Uh, as we talked about this morning, you know, there has been a, a big jump up in trash, and, and they've done a good job in handling that, but it's just laying out the requirements uh, to provide the service uh, to the county citizens. Um, another thing that we added in there was uh, allowing the county to come back in and do audits to make sure that the haulers are charging under the maximum ceiling for the solid waste rates that are set. Next slide, please. This concludes the presentation. With that, the department recommends approval of the ordinance. Thank you. Questions? Commissioner Mariano. Yeah, quick question. Um, yes, sir. Wasn't long ago, a few months back, we had a, uh, one of the haulers had a leak in the hydraulics and it damaged like two and a half rooms. And uh, we spent most of the day, most of the day negotiating it out. But they went out, they went out and ended up killing up kitten, bringing birds, and birds, and birds, and birds, actually wrote me the road there and take care of that. Uh, is that, uh, is that type of written in here? Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that would be covered under this ordinance. I'm sorry, your microphone is not on. If, could you repeat the question? Yes. So the question was, b back a few months ago, we had a hauler that had a leak in a hydraulic line, ruined about two and a half roads. Took us all day. We finally got it negotiated to where they were going to repair, replace, which they did. Um, and I just want to make sure that was in the ordinance as well. Yes, it is included in the ordinance update. So it'll be a little bit more defined about how they would go about <coughs> reimbursing us for things like leaking hydraulic fluid or leaking trucks. Okay. Any other questions? Any comments? Questions, comments? Seeing none, um, this is a public hearing, so I do. Oh, uh, do I hear Commissioner Wells? Did you have something, sir? Okay. I was Commissioner Oakley, but I'm waiting oh. on public. Okay, thank you. Uh, again, this is a public hearing. I do not have anybody signed up for this item that I can see. Is there anybody that is online or in the hallway for public no. comment? No one is here for P1. Okay, great. So it's back to the board. Uh, Ron Oakley makes uh, approval, moves approval. Okay, I have a motion by Commissioner Oakley. Uh, second. Second by Commissioner Starkey. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Okay. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye, motion passes 4-0, thank you. P2. P2 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 17th, 2020, June 24th, 2020, July 1st, 2020, and July 8th, 2020. Good afternoon, um, Commissioners. Denise Hernandez, item P2 is PDD 20-0629. It's an ordinance establishing the River Landing Community Development District pursuant to Chapter 190, Florida statutes provide, providing for authority and power of the district providing for powers and duties of the district, providing for the board of supervisors of the district, providing for district budget, providing for functions of the district, providing for miscellaneous, miscellaneous provisions, providing for an effective date. Today, this comes to you with a recommendation that you adopt the ordinance by roll call vote. Thank you. Questions? Questions? Comments? Same. 
Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Do, you, do we have anybody signed up? Mr. Chair, I believe you have the applicant online. Okay, excellent. Would the applicant like to speak? Good afternoon. This is uh, Wes Haber with Hopping Green and Sam's on behalf of the applicant. Um, I am happy to answer any questions, uh, but if, if there aren't any, then uh, I, don't, I, I don't feel compelled to make a presentation unless the board would like one. I don't think the board needs one. Um, I don't think I have anybody signed up for public comment. You can stay on just in case. Nope. There, there is no one Thank signed you. up for public comment. Yeah, there is no one signed up for public comment, so it's back to the board. I move for Ron, approval. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey. Ron Oakley seconds. I have a motion or a second by Commissioner Oakley. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Thank you. And um, Commissioner Oakley, just so you know, um, and maybe IT, your mic in, is cutting out in and out a little bit. Um, probably nothing you're doing. Could be a technical issue, but sometimes it's delayed or I'm not hearing you. So I apologize for not catching your motion. But Okay. Well, I've got an IT person here, so. Okay. Yeah, it's, I don't know if you guys noticed that. It's been doing it a little bit throughout the day. So. Away from the last meeting, you know, we had trouble with the sound and all. It's working fine. Okay. All right. So moving on to P3. Item P3 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 17, 2020, June 24, 2020, July 1, 2020, and July 8, 2020. Denise Hernandez, Planning and Development, PDD 20-0630, an ordinance establishing the Summerstone Community Development District pursuant to Chapter 190 Florida Statutes, providing for authority and power of the district, providing for powers and duties of the district, providing for the Board of Supervisors of the district, providing for the district budget, providing for the functions of the district, providing for miscellaneous provisions, providing for an effective date. Uh, the, we recommend that you adopt the ordinance by roll call vote. Thank you. Um, anybody on the line from the... The app from the applicant that we know of? No? Okay. Uh, yeah. Hi, this is Wes Haber, and I represent this petitioner as well. Okay. Um, again, happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, sir. And John Duperty from Four Star Group is here as well, if necessary. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do anybody sign up to speak on this item? No one is in the queue. Okay. Thank you. Back to the board. Move for approval. Motion by Commissioner Second. Starkey. Second, Second by Commissioner Oakley. I think actually, sorry, Commissioner Oakley, you're, you're too slow on the trigger again. Commissioner Mariano beat you. He, uh, motion by <laughs> Commissioner Starkey. Second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Clerk. Motion passes 4 0. Moving on down the road, P4. I'm sorry, item P4? P4? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, was published in the Tampa Bay Times April 5th, 2020. PDD 20-0489, Denise Hernandez, Planning and Development, Ordinance of Amending the Pasco County Comprehensive Plan, providing for a large-scale comprehensive plan text amendment to a future land use element goal. Future Land Use 5, Connor to Newtown in the Future Land Use Elements section, Future Land Use A-6 definitions of, future, of the Future Land Use Classifications, and a map amendment to the vis Highway Vision Plan, Map 7-36, providing for a repealer, severability, and an effective date. Today that we ask you to adopt the proposed comprehensive plan amendment uh, through roll call vote. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. I would assume the applicant is on the line or representation. Mr. Hobby is online. For All right. Mr. Hobby, good afternoon. Hey, Mr. Chairman, this is Clark Hobby, Hobby and Hobby PA, 109 North Brush Street, Tampa, Florida. Um, we have no objection to staff's recommendation and would ask you to approve the comp plan amendment. But I want to point out one thing. I think we may have one speaker who spoke on the morning agenda who has a question about an earlier comp plan amendment that's not uh, affecting Connerton, I believe. Um, and I just want the board to know that nothing we're doing in this plan amendment or the map changes for the highway vision network affects Aaron Cutoff or Collier Parkway in any way. Thank you, sir. Any questions for the applicant? Any questions for the applicant? If you want to stay by Mr. Hobby until we're done. Madam Clerk, do we have anybody signed up to speak on this item? 
We do. There are three individuals on the WebEx. The first person is Stephen Hen Henry. Okay. Mr. Henry, may you name and address for the record, please? Oh, oh, Steve Henry is with the applicant. Okay, so go ahead, Mr. Henry. Mr. Chair, if I, if I might. I'm, uh, I'm just here to answer any questions if there are any okay. questions. Okay, all right. So yeah, is, everybody, here for question. is there anybody that's online that, yes. okay. There's, that, there's others. I'm that's not with the applicant. That's well, my question. I would not so know. Mr. Henry is with the applicant, I believe. Kelly Love is with the applicant, I believe. Mr. Parks is a member of the public. So this is the gentleman that spoke this morning. Yes. It's okay. Just wanted to make sure. So we have one person from the community that's speaking. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and pull him up then. Okay. Mr. Rob Park. Mr. Park, please state your name and address for the record and start your comment. I, I have a question. Uh, Park 9614, Aaron Cutoff Road, Land of Lakes, Florida, 34639P4. <clears throat> this ordinance doesn't look anything like the permit application to the Army Corps. The ordinance includes some of the changes I commented about to the Army Corps. However, there's no reason for the Connerton Boulevard to continue to Aaron Cutoff. There's too much traffic on Aaron Cutoff. Instead, expedite the future Carlier Parkway extension and traffic off the Aaron Cutoff where there are already established homesteads close to the road. Doing this would also legitimize Ordinance 19-20. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's all that I have. Signed okay, up. thank you. Um, we need to change the screen, if you could, please. Back to. Sorry, sir. Give me one second. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Uh, Commissioner Starkey does have a question. Um, I didn't read the whole thing. There's a there's a lot here, but I was curious about the strikeouts for the downtown Connerton principles and standards. Okay. So either staff or Mr. Hobby or one of your associates would like to answer. I, can you all hear me? This is Clark Hobby. Yeah, we can. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, we moved a lot of things around within the agenda item, but we didn't actually take the standards out for downtown Connerton. They were moved into a new section that's just for village three slash four, which is what we're doing here. And really a big part of what we did was just to reorganize it so that it has specific standards for three and four. We are very much committed to creating the downtown Connerton concept that's been part of Connerton since we began. And a lot of the uh, connectivity plan that we've been working on that you'll see as part of the MPUD when it comes forward in a couple of months relates to connectivity to downtown Connerton. Excellent, because I think that project will be so good for Land Lakes. I'm real excited about this project. So, okay. Yeah. If, if I might address uh, Mr. Park's comment, I think he was, you know, making a larger point about maybe some land use issues that relate to the area in general. But just for the board's benefit, we're simply showing the highway vision map roads on there and Collier and Aaron Cutoff as they're already shown in the comprehensive plan and we're required to show them that way. So unless the board changes to make uh, changes to get rid of Aaron Cutoff as a, a highway vision map roadway, we must show it on our maps. Understandable. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for Mr. Chairman? Yes. For for purposes of the record, can I get somebody to confirm that there's no one at the kiosk for this item? Sure, go ahead. I did ask that earlier, but we can do it again. The only information... In and I said, is there anybody in the hallway? But there are two people in the hallway, but for item P12 is what information that I have. Okay, thank you. And they are on the list, um, Darlene Deegan and Janine Bruno. Okay. So to confirm, there's nobody else that would like to speak to this item, and I'll put it back to the board. Commissioner Oakley, those approval. Motion by Commissioner Oakley. Second. Second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much. And we'll wait for everybody to disengage. 
We move on to our public hearings. Give me one second here. Okay. If we could go ahead and proceed with the procedures for rezonings, Mr. Steinsneider, if you could review those, please. Be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are two rezoning agendas, regular and consent. Staff will present each application to the Board of County Commissioners. If staff or planning commission has recommended approval and there is no opposition, application will be considered by the Board without further presentation. If staff or planning commission has recommended denial or if there is opposition to the application, the applicant will be given five minutes for presentation. The opposition will be given three minutes for an individual or five minutes for a group representative, and the applicant will be given three minutes for rebuttal. Any individual disagreeing with staff or planning commission recommendation or anyone wishing to object to any condition of the rezoning may at this time request a petition be pulled from the consent agenda, in which case that application will be heard under the regular agenda later on during the meeting. Otherwise, all rezoning applications on the consent agenda will be approved by a single motion and vote. If you wish to speak to any petition, please give your name and address and whether or not you've been sworn for the record. These are quasi-judicial public hearings. The law in Florida is that mere public support or opposition of an application is insufficient for this board to take action. Please limit your comments to those criteria found within the board's land development code. Thank you, Mr. Steinsnyder. And I'm debating, what do we, do we want to go ahead and swear everybody in all at once, or do we need to do it individually, Mr. Steinsteiner? Which would you prefer? Uh, you can, I think you can swear everyone in and then have them confirm that they've been sworn okay. before they speak like we normally do. Okay, let's do that. Madam Clerk. Okay. For those that are here to speak on the following um, items that are on the public hearing, if you could please uh, respond. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth? So help you God. I'm sure they all said yes. We'll find out. Yeah. Okay. We have four public hearings on the consent agenda. These items we approve with one vote without a presentation unless there is someone here in objection. Those that are pre-registered to speak to any of the items on the public hearing prior to speaking, hopefully you were just sworn in by the clerk. Um, Items P5 through P8 are on the consent agenda. And Madam Clerk, do we have proof for those items? You can go ahead and do five through eight. Okay. Item P5 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 10th, 2020. Item P6 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 10th, 2020, and by affidavits of certified mailings and site postings. Item P7 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 10th, 2020, and item P8 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 17th, 2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Ms. Hernandez, it is now your show. P5 is PDD 27485. This is a zoning amendment. Pasco County Facilities Management, Duke Energy, Florida, LLC, change in zoning from MPUD Master Plan Unit Development District to AC Agricultural District, comes here with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Do I have anybody here to, on the line or on the kiosk that's to speak in objection to this item? We do not. We do not. Leave on consent. P6. PDD 20-0605, this is Development Agreement Amendment for Causeway Commercial Center MPUD Master Plan Unit Development. Development Agreement Amendment between Pasco County and Hagman Groves, Inc. in connection with the development of Causeway Commercial Center Master Plan Unit Development. This comes to you with a recommendation of approval and uh, it was found consistent with the comprehensive plan by the local planning agency. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Do we have anybody on the, at the kiosk or online that would like to speak in objection to this item? We do not. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Leave on consent. P7. PDD 20-0593, a development agreement, Bexley South MPUD Master Plan Unit Development, development agreement between Pasco County and NNP Bexley LLC in connection with the construction of the extension of turn lanes on State Road 54 at Suncoast Parkway comes to you with a recommendation of approval and it was found consistent with the comprehensive plan by the local planning agency. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Madam Clerk, anybody on the, in the kiosk or online that would like to speak in objection to this item? There are none. All right, leave on consent, PA. UT 20-0373, resolution by the Board of County Commissioners of Pasco County, Florida, designating that area commonly known 
as Cypress Preserve Phase 3C as a streetlight service area and consolidating Cypress Preserve Phase 3C and the existing Cypress Preserve Phases 1A, 1B, 2A into Cypress Preserve as a streetlight service area for streetlight improvements and to levy assessments against um, in accordance with it, against the property benefited by the street lighting improvements in accordance with the Pasco County Code of Ordinances, Chapter 94, Article 3, Sections 94 through 46, 46 through 94 56, comes to you with recommendation of approval. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Um, anybody here, Madam Clerk, to speak to this item in the kiosk or online? There are none. All right, leave on consent. That does it for how I will enter, entertain a motion. Um, I'll make that motion and excited about that Duke property for the uh, Enclote River oh, yeah, Park yeah, out yeah. in Holiday. That's going to be fantastic. Beautiful. Yeah, that's exciting stuff. So I have a motion. Second. I have a second. Madam Clerk, please call the oh, Motion by Commissioner Starkey. Second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. I have motion passes 4-0. Thank you. We will da, 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 proceed to the remainder of the public hearing items. Each item will be presented by staff and the applicant, and I will call for public comment by subject. Item P9, do we have proof? Yes, Chairman. Item P9 was published in the Tampa Bay Times June 3rd, 2020 and June 10th, 2020. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Joanne Revita, Real Property and Planning. The Real Property and Planning Team has received a petition to vacate a portion of a platted drainage and utility easement filed by Joshua Hemingway and Jennifer Garrison. The petitioners have requested this vacation for the purpose of correcting an encroachment and are requesting to vacate only the footprint of the house and the pool. There were no objections to this petition and the team recommends approval. Thank you. Would the applicant or the applicant's representative like to speak? Are they on the line as, as a panelist? They are not. They're on WebEx. Okay. But Any questions from the board? Before I ask for public comment, no questions this time. Um, this is a public hearing. Um, is anybody on the at the kiosk or online that would like to speak to this item? There are none. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I'll entertain a motion. Uh, move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Starkey. Second. Second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District One, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District Three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District Four, Commissioner Wells. District Five, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. All right, motion passes 4-0. Thank you. P10. P10. How are we I going? Know. Good afternoon. Uh, Derek Berger. Say the publication, please. No, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. um, item P was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 24, 2020 and July 1, 2020. Thank you, sir. All right, Derek. It's back to you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Derek Berger, Real Property and Planning Division. Um, Real Property Planning received a petition from CG Pasco LLC to vacate the underlying plats of Zephyr Hills Colony Plat in Crystal Springs um, and encompasses the Cobblestone MPUD. Um, the purpose of the uh, vacation is for future site development prior to the replat of the MPUD. Thank you, sir. Um, anybody from the applicant or the applicant's representative online to speak as a panelist? No? No? Okay, great. Um, questions from the board before I ask for public comment? No? Is this a public hearing? Anybody at the kiosk or online, Madam Clerk? There are none. Okay. Back to the board. Uh, Ron Ackley moves approval. Motion by Ron Commissioner Oakley. Second. Second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District, District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. All right, motion passes 4-0. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. All right, P-11. It's a long one. While you're walking, a resolution of Pasco County, Florida, establishing special assessment liens for certain paving and projects, East Hampton Village, PVAS 788, Hammock Roads, PVAS 3322, Color Street, PVAS 3114, Auto Lane, PVAS 982, Pebble Creek, or Pebble Beach Circle, PVAS 3304, Pine, Pine Tree Lane, PVAS, 3291, authorizing and providing the collection of special assessments for each of the named projects by the tax collector in accordance with the uniform method for the levy, collection, and enforcement of NAD ad valorem assessments pursuant to section 197.3632 Florida statute and providing for effective date. Madam Clerk, do we have proof? Yes, item P11 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 14th, 2020. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Commissioner. This is Caldwell Public, Public Works. Um, this is the pavement assessment, non-ad valorem uh, tax assessment. 
This is for the west side of the county. Next slide, please. Uh, there are a total of six pavement assessment projects. We have 13 streets and approximately three, mi three, three miles. Um, there were 278 uh, assessment letters sent out. Next slide, please. This is a summary of both the east side and the west side, and we have a total of eight pavement assessment projects, 22 streets, uh, four point, approximately 4.5 miles, about $1 million in total assessments, and uh, in terms of collection for this year on the tax bill, 136500 um, Staff is recommending that you approve the west side non ad valorem uh, assessment. Thank you, Ainsley. <clears throat> do we have any, but, well, first, board, do you have any questions before I ask for public comment? No? Okay. Madam Clerk, do we have anybody at the, ki at the kiosk or online that would like to speak to this item? No, here for okay. Back to the board. Questions, comments? Entertain a motion. Move approval. Ron Oakley. Motion by Commissioner Oakley. Second. Second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, <coughs> Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Thank you so much. P-12. P-12. And I know we do have people before on the kiosk, and I think actually on the line, too. So We have one on the line and two on the kiosk. All right. Beautiful. So we'll go ahead and hand it over to Ms. Hernandez. I'll do the publication. Please do. Item P-12 was published in the Tampa Bay Times May 24th, 2020. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, Denise Hernandez, Planning and Development Department. I'm going to do a full presentation on this one because this will be the first conditional, the first conditional use conditional. for a vacation rental that you hear. So it's PDD 20 CU 27. It's conditional use approval for a vacation rental, also formerly known as short-term rental in an R1MH single-family mobile home district. Uh, next slide, please. It's located in... Uh, on the east side of Amanda Avenue, approximately 265 feet south of Hudson Avenue. Next slide. Subject site contains a single family dwelling and was previously used as a regular long-term rental. On December 3rd, 2018, the property owner received an ordinance violation warning notice for operating the site as a vacation short-term rental without prior approval. So today the owner is seeking approval in order to resume the use of the site as a vacation rental, also known as a short-term rental in accordance with the Land Development Code, Section 402.5B. Next slide. Vacation rentals, are formerly known as short-term rentals, are defined as dwelling units that have been advertised as available more than three times per year for periods of fewer than 30 days at a time for use, occupancy, or possession by persons other than the owner. The Land Development Code provides in 402.5b that except for vacation rentals grandfathered pursuant to Ordinance 9921, existing or future dwellings may not be utilized for vacation rental purposes unless specifically authorized through the Master Plan Unit Development District process or the conditional use process. The subject application, um, one of the requirements to submit the application is that you have to have a petition in favor of a minimum of 51% of the lots and in this, this is in the Gulf Breeze Heights um, subdivision recorded plan, which the applicant did provide. The applicant provided um, a, uh, an actual um, signature, signatures of 53.8% of the lot owners. So this is the surrounding zoning. The surrounding zoning, as you can see, is uh, north uh, R1MH to the south R1MH. Um, and uh, it consists of a total of today, under today's standards, it has a total of 11 lots, but these are all uh, part of a total of 52 uh, lots that have been combined into a total of 11 lots. So there's 11 or 10 owners out there right now. The future land use, um, the fo following slide please, is retail office residential. As you can see, this parcel is located uh, just south of Hudson Avenue and you see uh, US 19 to the east. Following slide. Access to the property is from Amanda Avenue. It shows the access. And this comes to you with a recommendation, following slide, of, of approval with conditions. Uh, basically um, asking that, requesting that the applicant would have to comply with the requirements of the Land Development Code 402.5B, which includes um, approval notification requirements, registration, which is an annual registration, and requirements for operation. Also that the applicant comply with the requirements of the county's tourist development tax and collections, chapter 102 of the Pasco County Code and section 125.0104 Florida statutes. 
Uh, following condition is also that the applicant um, comply with Pasco County Vacation Rental Reopening Plan for vacation rental operations during the ongoing safe, smart, step-by-step -step plan for, for Florida's recovery. The following condition is just a revocation condition. If the applicant uh, does not follow the conditions of approval, it could be revoked. And um, your standard condition that the um, acknowledgement form be signed. This comes through with a recommendation of approval with conditions from both the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. I'm here with any questions, and I know we do have the applicant who is on WebEx, and I believe we, too, we do have two people at the kiosk. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Um, I'll answer the questions from the board, or still answer the questions from the board before I move on to public comment. Uh, Denise, let me ask you a question. Uh, reading through the agenda, there was like violation after violation from fires being set to looks like right of ways being disturbed, sheriffs going out there, deputies going out there. Can you tell sure. me, have all those, have we looked at all that? In, yes. What, 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 what's the status with all that? Sure. So um, I can speak to um, the items that have, that are under code enforcement okay. and those items have all been closed including this particular violation, and um, Ms. Maricela is on, the, on WebEx, and she can answer that as well, um, that she stopped renting the place out under the short-term rental criteria, so the less than the 30 days. Um, as far as I am concerned, and uh, we did check with code enforcement, um, Officer Victoria, uh, she did state that all the code enforcement items had been closed. Okay. Uh, is the RV still out there? The RV is not out there, no. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions? Questions? Well, I, I Commissioner didn't Starkey? know we had this um, ability to get short-term rentals, so I'm sure there are a lot of people that need to come in and go through this process. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why it's a good idea to kind of go through the ordinance a little bit with you because we're, we're probably going to see a bit more in the in the future, yeah. So, um, as far as safety, you did say someone goes in and checks to make sure that this this is safe for guests to stay in. Um, that's that's part of the um, the reopening plan from the state of Florida, um, from the governor. Yep. Yeah. So, who from the county checks these things? Um, I don't know if we actually check it or that's done by uh, the state. The state's going to check all the short-term rentals. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that I think that falls on us. I don't think our plan has us inspecting every one of them. It's on the owner to comply with the plan. Well, it w it would be good to check that out. So I can, if that's okay, I can answer that question. If I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, under the governor's order, the before we opened up short-term rentals in the county again, we had to submit a plan to the state. And that plan was accepted by the state, which therefore allows us to start allowing short-term rentals again. So they accepted the plan. So whatever plan was submitted by the staff, they it was accepted. That's, then, correct. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And as the administrator said, the way that the plan was done by Pasco County was to put that onus on the short-term rental operator. Yeah, and the short-term rental operator submits the, their plan to us exp explaining how they're doing hygiene, the different things that they're doing. And we have that in here? Did um, I not see it? Did this one hasn't, it? hasn't been approved, so we're not, we're, we're, it's a condition of approval. Okay, so once they get this, then they'll they have to submit, submit a plan to, to reopen? Absolutely, yes. Okay, because I'm a fan of short-term rentals. I use them all the time, but I just think there's, there's a certain amount of basic safety that has to occur in these, so. Okay. Huh? Any other questions? Okay, so um, let's go to the applicant first. It's uh, Ms. Maricela. Um. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, ma'am, you have, you have the floor. You're the applicant. So um, if you'd like to state, make a statement, you're, you're able to. And then there may be questions from this board to, for you, too. Okay, I'm not sure if the camera is capturing my image because I see it's a little dark. Yeah, so uh, Henry, can I give you a suggestion? Um, see the, that window, sure. behind, those blinds behind you, if you shut those, you're just backlit right now. It'll probably help the situation. Okay. Well, not much. <laughs> I thought, thought it might help, but um, 
That's okay. Uh, we can oh, hear you. Uh, we can sorry. hear you. We can hear you. We need her to state her name. And yeah, okay. let me just get her going for a second. Thanks. If you get closer. Okay. There you go. I can see you a little bit. That's okay. good. We can keep it there. Now, name and address for the record, please. Okay. Um, so, yes, I'm Marisa Anziani. I'm the owner um, and sole proprietor of Camping Oasis, which is um, the name of the business and the property that I, I'm trying to get the conditional use um, approved. Ma'am, before you start, um, can you provide the address and also whether or not you have been sworn? Uh, yes, I'm at 14134 Amanda Avenue. This is Hudson, Florida, 34667. And uh, did you, did you I can go ahead and... Well, let's swear you in again. How, let's get, just keep your hand up. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, so help you God? Yes. All right, thank okay. you. You may proceed. Okay, I want to state that I got um, the neighbors here... Um, to kind of uh, reiterate what I'm going to say, I got John Merritt and I got uh, Sims Henry. Um, John Merritt is from 14126 Amanda Avenue and um, Sims is from the RV World who owns about six properties in this subdivision. Okay. Okay. So if they would like to speak, we would have to um, swear them in and they would sure. also have to be... Um, put in the queue, <laughs> well, <laughs> Mr. Reichstein-Center, I mean, how's, how uh, would you... So I would take the applicant's comments first. Mm -hmm. She did register that the other people would be with her, okay. so then we go with three minutes for Each. the other two people that are with her, and then we'd move out to the kiosk. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so if, um, I, again, whoever's up next, what if you're, you said you have two people there. I can see one gentleman, and I think I see somebody to the left. So if that person can state their name and address for the record, uh, we will start the three minutes. And I need Please. to know that they've been sworn. And have you, been, have you all been sworn? Did you no, ever? you can go ahead. Okay, well, let you both, put your, both, both of you put your hands up, and we'll swear you in again. Your right hand. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Great. Thank Excellent. you. State your name and address for the record, and then you can begin your comments. John Merritt, 14126 Amanda Avenue, Hudson, Florida, 4667. Right, great. Anything you'd like to say, sir? Uh, just briefly, yeah, I live directly next door to the property. <laughs> if anybody in the neighborhood is going to be negatively impacted by this, it would be me. And I have absolutely no objection to this at all. I have full confidence in what she's doing. She's very responsible. She takes very good care of the property. And uh, I'm very, very comfortable with this situation. A lot more than if she ran it out long term to maybe young kids or something like that. So I think this is a, a lot better way to do it for the neighborhood, for commerce. But I think everybody, it's just a win win for all of us. Uh, my name is Sims Henry. Uh, my address is 14103 US19. Okay. You hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Yeah, mine's simple too. Uh, Maricel has done nothing but upgrade the, the, the present as well as this property. Um, she's very hands on, and uh, it's just pretty simple. It, it, there's nothing but bettering the property thank you sir and uh we're mm -hmm. gonna put you guys on hold for a second here while we go ahead unless there's any questions from the board i'm sorry any questions from the board for the applicant seeing okay seeing none um we're gonna put you guys on hold stay put and we will move to uh are we gonna do the person on the phone first or are we gonna go ahead and go to the uh the, the hallway do you have anyone on the phone that i'm aware of oh we don't Okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and go to the lobby and whoever's up first, if they could, um, if we could have, okay. If we could have Miss, hi, okay. Hi, Miss Deegan. If you could um, let us know if you were sworn or not earlier. Please. I have been sworn. Thank I you. Darlene Deegan on 4137 Amanda Avenue. Amanda Ave is not a part of a subdivision, but a tiny 40 foot wide and section private dead end road that has been closed off from all the commercial zone lots 
on the south end of Amanda <coughs> Avenue for about 15 years, including where RV World is and Mr. Centenary. There is only five residential structures and three of these have been and remain homesteaded properties. The Planning Commission hearing in June voted to approve the special exception on the basis of generating tax revenue. My residence directly across the road from Camping Oasis was purchased in 2012 to retire here. Since the illegal operation of setting up multifamily dwellings on 14134 Amanda with the rental of the RV in the back and the front structure with short-term rentals, I have had issues with the property. Owner Maricela of Camping Oasis, her family and renters parking out in the road, blocking my ingress and egress to back down to my driveway into the garage. To make the situation worse, Camping Oasis erected a chain link fence out into the road without securing boundary surveys of 14134. Since April 2019, two garbage cans continuously remain outside the chain link fence in the actual road, even when empty. I've had problems with vacation or dogs let out without leashes who defecate on my property and the mess is left for me to deal with. Vacationers have invited additional company and held parties into the night. When not rented out, Maricela herself invites overnight guests and has parties into the night at the property. In the June 2020 hearing, Maricela stated Airbnb verifies all guests. Not true. Airbnb has identity information only on the person that books the reservation, not the other guests. It is common occurrence in the industry for the person booking to bring more guests than noted on the reservation. For this reason, owners place a camera at the front door entrance. Camping Oasis has such camera at the entrance. I incurred a theft while the illegal short-term rental business has been in operation since 2018. In June, the June hearing, John Merritt at 14126 stated he knew if there was any issues with renters at 14134. But that is not possible as Merritt just moved on 14126 in January 2020 after purchasing the property from Camping Oasis December 2019. I object to granting a special exception to allow short-term rentals for Camping Oasis at the property, which was an annual rental when purchased by Maricela in 2007 and should remain the same. We have no problem with the annual rentals. This is my homestead. My rights should be preserved, keeping the private road the same way it was in 2012, knowing the people coming and going. Maricel is a Florida licensed realtor in 2007, and she knows she was in violation renovating the property without building permits, using unlicensed contractors, operating two units on the short-term rentals on this property, not zoned for it. The specialist Special exception should not be granted at the expense of the homeowners who reside here and purchased our property before. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we do have somebody else. Is that Miss? Is that Jeannie Bruno? Bruno? That is Bruno. Okay. Hi, Miss Bruno. Have you been sworn? I've been sworn. Hi, right. are you? Okay. Name and address for the record, please. My name is Jeannie Bruno. I live directly next door to Marisela Anziani at 14200 Manza Avenue, Hudson, Florida, 34667. All right. Thank you. You can start your comment. Okay, um, my comment is that um, when I bought, purchased this property, I retired working as a nurse for 20 years. I came down here. It's a quiet, dead end street. I thought it was residential. Maricela had my ex husband do all the work on the property. I let her know he's not licensed or contracted. Everything done on the property was illegal and very dangerous. She came to me complaints and said, Don't complain to me because you knew it was all illegal, what you were doing here. Um, since she was renting out the, the property, every day, different people would come. They would throw Heineken bottles in my backyard, denting my friend's car. Um, I made a comment to Maricela about um, the transients and the smelling of drugs and the blasting of music, even with my TV on the loudest number, with my AC running, I can't even hear myself. And I had four kidney surgeries in the past six months. And um, it's just something that living in a residential area, I shouldn't have to go through. It's not right. It's not legal there. And um, I usually get along with all my neighbors just fine. I have no problem with it. But, you know, when somebody dents my friend's car with a Heineken bottle and the next day they're gone, where am I going to go to look for them? But I told her about that. And she said she got money for, she made a claim to get go, can't go Oasis because they wrecked her house too while they were there. But they're not, they didn't fix my friend's car and they didn't do, fix any damage on my property. Also, animals come sometimes when the rentals, they got in my backyard and almost killed my two chihuahuas. Now, why do I need all this transients when I bought it on a dead-end private road? I purchased this house to retire in, and I don't need it looking like a hotel with 20 kids screaming at me, cursing, being belligerent in my backyard, drunk, when I asked them to lower the music and be quiet. They curse at me and say sexual things towards me. This is not what I need being sick like this. I purchased a property in a residential area for it to be residential. 
not not zoned out every other night, her hands in towels and not knowing what the hell's going on there. Two times when Maricela wasn't renting and she was there, she left a fire going in the fire pit, which where the fire department had to be called. It was blowing towards my property. My house could have burned down. This is all very dangerous, and I, I don't think it should be allowed. It's a dead end street. There's only five houses on this dead end street. These camping, the RV world, that's all, that's not even near this. This is a quiet area that I purposely bought to have a quiet retirement, not have the kids in and out blocking things, cursing me out, saying sexual things, unzoned, illegal stuff going on, drinking drugs. I don't need this. I don't want to live near this stuff. It's not right, and it shouldn't be have to put through this. Annual's fine because I know who's living there, but every day a different person is not right, and it's not fair to me being a homeowner and homesteaded there. I don't agree with it at all. I'm sorry. Thank you. to the applicant again if there's any questions from the board for the applicant or if they'd like to make a statement in reference to the yep and I need to go ahead and take this off the hallway if we could at this time and go back to the applicants um, and Commissioner question, Starkey go ahead question to the applicant um, so I, I just tried to look at the site on Google Earth and I there's are there two proper two lots. so so you've got this blue house and then you're going to put an RV uh, or a mobile home or whatever that is as well. There's two properties. No, I, I, I'm the I, first. RV. Oh, she's frozen. I'm sorry. I, I bought the RV for personal use and I was storing in the back. I was keeping like all the uh, linens and housekeeping stuff and, and detergents and everything in the RV. Um, and, a false accusation. I never rented the RV. I did put it on a website called Outdoor C because I was willing to rent it out so people can take it out. Um, that kind of person. I'm always looking for, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm always looking for ways to um, make money and do business. But I did not have at any point anybody stay in the RV in the back. Um, as far as um, the drugs and I mean, I have to say that um, Darlene's son brought a lot of cops to the street. He actually was in December. Um, he was in and out of jail. So uh -oh. to say that drugs were here in this house, I think it's uh, um, misleading. Uh, we had vacationers that are either uh, snowbirds, um, they come from Canada, um, only one time I had Floridians, there were young kids like Janine stated, and I did file a claim with Airbnb, which was just um, resolved. And I'm sure those people got blocked from renting again. Um, I'm sure that happens when, you know, you're doing business and you run into people that don't take care, um, you know, but that was just one out of, you know, all the nice people that came through here. So um, anything um, that that I heard, I mean, uh, I stopped um, the short-term rentals once I got the code violation, but um, or the violation. But I think Darlene is the kind of person that likes to use and abuse the government, and she kept calling code enforcement. Victoria kept calling me and say, "Hey, I got another complaint," and I said, "Go ahead and knock on their door. They're there for thirty days. They're there for two months." Um, as far as the, the law enforcement, she's called law enforcement on me several times, and I'm sure the records show that I wasn't doing anything wrong. There's just park, cars parked on the street that she says they're blocking her driveway, but it was not the case. Either way, I always told uh, the officers that I would move the vehicle so that it wouldn't uh, be any problem. I try to approach her uh, in a civil matter a couple times. I have video of her trying to run me over. I just wanted to talk to her. Um, my neighbor tried to mow the lawn right here. She called the cops for that the first time. I said, I called the county and I told them that I wanted to clean this because there was a lot of snakes and rats and all kinds of animals. Even um, homeless people were kind of hiding behind there. So I was like, let's clean that up and, you know, and just uh, try to maintain it. So I called the county and public works couldn't come out because they said that that was uh, owners that had to clean it up. So I started cleaning it. She called the cops, but the second time they showed up, they actually gave her a ticket for not cutting her grass. So, I mean, I, I think I'm trying to contribute to something good. I'm trying to clean up the place. I'm trying to 
um, Janine stated um, illegal drugs here. She, I am a witness and I have a text from her that I can show that she had people selling drugs from her house and doing shady things. And I know Darlene's got that on camera because she's got cameras pointing to everybody's home on this street. If Linda was available, she would also come and say that that's kind of an invasion of privacy because it's one thing to surveillance your own property, but to have cameras. John Merritt. Yeah, she gets three minutes for rebuttal. That's what your rules say. Yeah, Maricela, 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 can you hear me? Just not your head. Okay, so we only had so much time for rebuttal. Okay, so now we have to go back to the board. Okay. Um, Commissioner, Commissioner Mariana, did you have a something? Yeah, let me, let me ask. So all the code and violations were fixed. So all the legal construction was corrected, the code uh, permitted. Maricela may be able to answer this question because I believe she's in the process of taking care of those right now. That hasn't been done yet? Can we at, well, it takes a period of time to get building permits and things like that. So yeah. perhaps we need to ask her that question. So yeah, you can, uh, a commissioner can yeah. ask, yeah. ask a question. So hold on, just, you can, exactly. Maricela, hold on, Maricela, please. Um, so just answer the commissioner's question. We can't talk about other things now, okay? So if you can answer the commissioner's question, please. Uh, yes, I am in the process of um, asking for all the permits. The portion of the house that I modified, that's been corrected and it's all good. It's just unpermitted work now that I'm dealing from 2002 and 2004. And because I am in a flood zone, I have, I'm, I'm probably going to have to make an appraisal after all this um, because I'm, a, I'm exceeding the 50% improvements um, for properties in a, in a flood zone because of this 2002 and 2004 um, unpermitted work. So I am in the process of working with the county on this because um, obviously all this is after the fact. No, that will be a struggle, I'm sure. Um, next question for you. When I'm looking at the listings part of the feedback that we got, uh, there's a gentleman named Patrick that says, creatures in the attic, random people knocking on the doors throughout the night and day. She's renting an RV out in the back. That's all random, too. Oh, it's behind a very busy... Oh. Let me finish. Uh, sure. Oh, it's behind a very busy shopping plaza that never seems to close. Um, then you respond back, Patrick, I apologize. Your stay wasn't as you expected. However, I can tell you that first, there are no monsters in the attic. One second. Squirrels running in the roof. Second, neighbor had friends over coming over. They were happened to be knocking on my door. Third, the RV was not rented during your stay, but is mentioned in the listing that I may be renting it out to other Airbnb guests. So you made a comment that you don't rent it out, but at the same time in your comments here, you're I saying you do rent it out. It. No, I've never rented the RV. Now, I, I'm learning about all this, and the minute that I found out that I cannot do vacation rent, um, I... I bought the, the RV also with the intention of making money, but I did not rent it to anybody because of all this that I was learning from code enforcement. So no, at any point did I rent that RV. Okay. Any other questions, I'm Commissioner? I'm good. Okay. Qu any qu other questions from any other board members? Commissioner Oakley, Commissioner Wells, Commissioner Starkey, any other well, questions? Well, I, I am looking at photos that it looks like, did you drive through your neighbor's Vegetable garden? I don't, do you see these pictures, guys? I don't know if that's relevant, but. Uh, I'm sorry. Probably not relevant, so. Okay. Just part of the record, I guess. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant at this time? If not, I'm going to bring it back to the board. So if we go ahead and um, go back to the regular camera, please. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So it's to, it's to the board? Any other questions for Ms. Hernandez? I do. Go ahead, um, Commissioner Mario. So, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when I look at a property that is in violation, and it's the records show that it's had violation for over two years plus, and it still hasn't been resolved yet, 
Um, I don't know where we're going to look at to approve this right now until that's all done. I mean, are, are we would be in a little premature bringing this forward because is, is the structure inhabitable the way it's set right now? I don't know that the that there is any question about the structure being habitable. I think what Ms. Maricela was speaking of is that she's dealing with building permits for unpermitted work uh, that occurred prior to the time that she uh, purchased the property in two, mm. between 2002 and 2004. And because she's dealing, as I understand, and she could probably correct me, because she's dealing with that and because though that puts her over the 50% rule under FEMA, there's some additional steps that she's having to take, including, sounds like, uh, obtaining a private appraisal. Um, showing the uh, the value of the, the actual structure. So I think she's having to show some additional things based on, um, based on what's going on there. So knowing that people, and this is one of the comments I think were either in there or said orally, that there's danger for people are coming in there because electrical might not have been done properly, plumbing, the roofing structure, or whatever was put into there, converting a porch to a bedroom. I mean, you, we could have some issues out there that I don't know if we really want people from an Airbnb product coming in there to go use that until this is done. So if we haven't got it in our ordinance, I'm guess, guessing we don't, they have to have a, an approved living structure that's fully approved by permitting. I mean, um, we can potentially add a condition that states that it, that the Building permits have to be secured prior to um, it being used, con the, the use as, uh, as a uh, short-term or vacation rental. Mm -hmm. But so, that has to occur first. Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Mariano, so you, your ordinance is a land use ordinance that assumes that the structure is acceptable for the purposes that it's being put to. I mean, it, it, that's you normally don't get to a point where you've got a building that has violations and you're making a change to its land use. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and I believe Mr. Hernandez is right, if you wish to approve it, you could put something in the conditional use that says, this doesn't become effective until all of your other things are, re you can't rent it to the public until all these other things have been resolved that you're, you've got outstanding with the building department. It, but normally that, that wouldn't be, the, the point I was trying to make is that wouldn't be part of your ordinance because you're only dealing with the uses that are occurring in a structure, not the structure itself. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, we can't change what we've already approved for this Airbnb ordinance because the way the le 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 legislature has set up that any changes that's correct. It, it's it's pretty much frozen in time. You're you're grandfathered with the ordinance that you have currently. If you make changes to it, you lose that grandfathering status for the ordinance. Right. We have one further question. The area, and I've been up there with the residents that uh, at least one that spoke, and uh, so I've seen it. I've talked with it. And I, I know the neighborhood. And as far as I'm, when I look at the way it's drafted, it says you would have 51% approval of the area, or you say- Of the lots. plat owners. There's lots. Mm -hmm. Yes. But if you go into this area, it's a dead end street, mm -hmm. there's only like five there. Right. Are you based upon the five? It's based upon what the ordinance states, which is the owners of the plat. So um, there's a total number of lots, which is 52 in that plat, which granted was recorded in 1925. Um, currently, so there's, uh, Mr. Griffin, who signed the, the no, applicant. So there's, includes, the general area, not includes the, the 52 area. lots, which is today 11 parcel ID numbers. Okay. So uh, seven of the 11 parcel ID number owners have signed okay. in favor. All right, I'm, I'm good with my questions. Okay. okay. Um, Commissioner De Tarkey. Denise, I'm looking at the picture of the fence in front of a house. I thought the house was blue, but there's a a truck driving into a property, the fence is backwards. The fence, the correct fence application is the finished side is to the road and the structural side is to the inside. So will all, will these mistakes get corrected at some point? That's not included in your condition. So if you want to include that in your condition, I would imagine that you can do so. Well, 
It's up to the board. Yeah, well, I, I would want the fence to be installed correctly. Okay. So if there was a motion, you would want that included in the motion? Yes. Uh, I'm ready to make a motion. Um, I'll move approval with the conditions of the fence is properly installed, as Commissioner Starkey has stated. I'll also say that we'll have all the inspections done and approved, um, so it's fully up to code in our process. Um, I'm going to second with discussion. Okay. Um, like I said, I am a, a, a frequent user of short-term rentals, but I have never had a disturbance where anyone was called on me, and I sure wouldn't want to live next to one where a disturbance was called. So I think there's a responsibility to this property owner that she doesn't upset the peace of the neighborhood. Um, and she has a responsibility with her tenants. So I want to say that we put a uh, requirement in there that if, you know, if the peace is disturbed X amount of times, then it can no longer be a short-term rental. You have to have some, some kind of responsibility for your community. Okay. So I'm going to, you would have to yeah, change so the motion, so you'd have to amend I would the motion. Amend. I would amend it that, you know, if there's more than three calls in a year, then it can no longer be a short-term rental. Is that a good number? I, I'm just making that up. I so can I, can I jump in the discussion real quick, too? So I, and I see where you're going, and maybe Mr. Steinsteiner can jump in in a second, too. How would we quantify... Right, we don't want calls because we right. just don't want people just calling to a neighborhood call, war. Yes, yeah, right, so there is a way to war. say that um, substantiated, proven disturbances and who of the be, peace. And who would who would be the, the one sheriff. to follow that? And what and what department would actually? Would it at all be helpful okay. so that yeah. I read the revocation condition to see if okay. yes, perhaps please. that's something that would be yeah. good for the board? So sure. this is your condition, your proposed condition number five. Yeah. This approval is subject to the provisions of the Land Development Code, Section 402.4.J, revocation of special exception and conditional use approvals. In addition, staff may initiate enforcement for violations of the conditions of approval by any of the methods available in the Land Development Code, Section 108, through revocation of the registration of the vacation rental or through revocation of the conditional use pursuant to the provisions of Section 402.4.J, Revocation of special exception and conditional use approvals, or both. But that that seems well. First, that's a new word for me. I know what I've heard of revocation. I've never heard of revocation. No, no, it's revocation. That's oh, a, it I'm, is. I'm oh, sorry, my just, Miami okay. accent. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm from Miami, so I should have gotten that too. Um, that doesn't that doesn't like have any. Um, <laughs> that just seems open ended to me. Mr. Chair, this is David Goldstein. Hi, go ahead. Hi, um, I think it would be helpful if Denise actually pulled up 402.4J because it it talks about some of the nuisance criteria that Commissioner Starkey is referring to, and I I think that would be helpful. Yeah, if the, you know if it's there, that's good. So, Can you give me a second. Yeah, and sorry about that. <laughs> has a computer that you can While there's a pause in the action, um, the motion that is currently on the floor, the two additional stipulations are in addition to what's in the, the staff's proposal per currently, correct? Staff's recommendations plus the, these two conditions. Correct, but I'm, I'm seeking clarification there, on my second yeah. uh, addition. Because if we have it, there's no, you know, we don't. Doing okay over there, uh, Commissioner Oakley? All is well? Yeah, all is well. <laughs> I'm waiting on you. Okay. <laughs> but this is this is our first short-term rental uh, yeah. hearing, so. I know, just checking to make sure you don't have any questions or anything, sir. No, it's just, okay. um, just, just one thing. You know, when you talk about uh, if you approve this and then have it where someone can call in and you give them three calls, that could uh, that could come within less from somebody. And it yeah, just we have to be careful. It's about that. Hard, 
it's really going to be hard to enforce or, you know, it, it'd be tough on code to come back with that, especially if that happens from a neighbor that's upset at it to begin with. And that could happen. I, I think you want to avoid that part. You don't want that to happen. But I agree with the other things that you're talking about, of uh, putting the stipulation that all those things that need to be fixed as far as uh, permit issues and bringing it up to code to be right. I think those things definitely have to be done before this goes in full. So I think that's a part of it. I just don't know how you do that on calls, like talking about three calls. Yes, sir. That could happen in a day if you're not careful. So. Right. Yes, sir. Ms. Hernandez? Sure. So I'll read 402.4J. I won't read the entire section, but basically it states that an initiation of a revocation proceeding, only the county administrator or designee upon a determination of probable cause may petition the BCC for a re review and or revocation of a conditional use or special exception where such use continuation, expansion, alteration, or change of use constitutes an annoyance to the community, is injurious to the health, safety, or welfare of the community or to the public, tends to corrupt the manners and morals of the public or the community, tends to attract vagrants, loiterers, or habitually intoxicated individuals, has a history of repeated incidents of violence, results in a substantial depreciation of lowering of property values in the community or neighborhood, violates any of the conditions of approval, was approved as a result of materially misleading or inaccurate information, or results in the incre increase in adverse effects on surrounding properties such as noise, traffic, odor, dust, increase in acreage, or change in the square footage of acreage utilized for the special exception or the conditional use and the owner has failed to obtain an amendment, has resulted in repeated violations of federal, state, or local regulations, or any one significant violation of such regulations. Yeah, I think that's good, actually. That's good. So that's 402.4. Well, we don't need the other one. Okay. So, so just with the one fence amendment. Okay. So fence amendment more? and okay. Go ahead. Uh, and all the county. And all the county regulations to be resolved and permitted out. Okay. Which was in your motion? It was a motion. Okay. okay. And, and I second. second. Okay. Yeah. So hopefully the um, I know we have uh, seems like the neighbors have some uh, things to work out amongst themselves and yeah. and hopefully they can uh, all just get along. So with that, I have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Motion by Commissioner Mariana, second by Commissioner Starkey. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 4-0, and that should do it for the public hearings unless somebody try to sneak something in. I didn't see. No? Okay. So can I just ask a question, and this was probably for Mr. Biles or, or Mr. Steinsnyder. Um, and obviously everything we do up here is, is important, um, but I, I, I personally have a little bit of, of a concern about this board hearing these uh, conditional uses for vacation rentals or short-term rentals. And I say that because as, as uh, time goes on and they become more and more common um, and we see these, um, so this not be the administrative action of some type? I would highly recommend against it. The, so the, 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 the problem is that, as you have here, I mean, this was an odd cir circumstance because of so few, why you don't see these on a regular basis is if you have a dispute, sub, well, if you have a subdivision that is your typical subdivision yeah. where you have 250 to 500 residential units. I mean, it, you look at your own or, or Gulf Harbors, or, and you have to get 51% of everybody in the neighborhood to sign off on it. That's why you don't see these. I understand. Um, so, but on the other hand, if, if you do, and 51% of the subdivision that isn't really close to it signs off on it and they move it forward you want to I would think you would want to hear from those in a public hearing setting those neighbors that are directly adjacent going to be directly impacted by this uh, new use and that I mean that's while there are enforcement issues about Airbnb or VRBO 
um, the, the way your ordinance was originally set up was these pods were supposed to be designated before you even sold the first home so that they knew what they were moving into. No, no, I understand. I'm, I'm not advocating for or against. It was, it was really just a question. Um, you know, if you look at areas, so I, I recently, it wasn't long ago we did, I'm not going to get into my personal life, but, you know, we did a VRBO somewhere. How's that? And we've done it many, many a times, um, whether it be in Florida or up in the northern Georgia or something like that. Um, and there's quite a few in those areas, as you know. I'm going to have a sneaky suspicion they don't all go in front of the Board of County Commissioners, especially somewhere like St. Petersburg, where you've got thousands of them. So I'm just thinking about the future. Right now, it's, it's easy going. It's not a big deal. Um, but as the county grows, it continues to grow. And, and you know, some of these, you know, now listen, HOAs and CDDs can make their own rules up. They don't want them. They don't want them. That's, that's up to them. But, um, I mean, if you start, uh, we get to the point where you, you get lots of these. And, and like I said, these wouldn't come before you if they were done in the initial establishment of the, of the neighborhoods. Because the way, and Denise can correct me if I'm wrong, but the way the ordinance, the way the ordinance is created, it's, mm -hmm. it gets, this is all really supposed to get approved up front. And this is one of those that is trying to get an after-the-fact approval. No, no, I understand. But if I were to, I don't want to really get in. Let's let's talk offline. I don't. We don't need to have this conversation now. It's going to take up too much time. Let's just we'll we'll have a side conversation. Is that okay? Is that okay with everybody? I don't think I need to take any more time. But all right. Thank you so much. Okay. Guess what? Coming back to regular agenda. First up is R7, presentation of Pasco Cares, update to the Board of County Commissioners. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. So R7, Kathy Pearson, Assistant County Administrator, uh, Public Services. So R7 is withdrawn. You're going to hear that on R10. Okay. So we'll go to R8. Yep, thank you. So we're going to hear that on R10. We'll go to R8. Do you have a, R8. We have another confirmation today. I do. We have a confirmation. So we're respectfully asking the board to confirm Mr. Brian Hoban as the new community services director. Brian is with us. He's going to come up and say a few words here in a minute, but a little bit about Brian. He started with the county back in July of 2016. He worked with uh, the Internal Services Fiscal Department. He also worked for the Emergency Operations Center. And for the last two and a half years, he's been with us under public services, serving as our program administrator. March 25th, during this wonderful COVID pandemic, um, Brian was put to the test with public services and all the services that we had to put in Pasco Cares, helping with restaurants, senior services, all of that great stuff, and has done a fantastic job. So I'm going to let Brian say a few words. So, Brian. All right. Thanks, Ms. Pearson. Good afternoon. We don't need your address, by the way. Okay, You're great. <laughs> Good afternoon, <laughs> Brian <your> Hoban, <laughs> Public Services Administrator and Interim Community Services Director. Um, you know, as Kathy said, I've been with Pasco County for four years now, and, and I would argue in those four years that the past three and a half months have really been the most important of those four years uh, serving as the interim community services director. I really want to say, you know, especially serving through a, a national pandemic that um, that community services team is, is really a phenomenal team to work with. They have accomplished some amazing things. Their ability and willingness to change and adapt during this time has been phenomenal. And um, I really am proud to have worked with them. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Board of County Commissioners as well as County Administrator Biles and Assistant County Administrator Kathy Pearson for all the support that you guys provide to that team, allowing us to make a difference to our community every single day. So thank you all very, very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I, my team says very, very positive things about you. So thank you. I'm, I've heard you're very responsive and you give back to my team very, very quickly. So that's very much appreciated. So thanks for all you're doing. Any other statements or questions from the board? Thank you. Appreciate it. Starkey. Thank you. Anything from uh, Commissioner Oakley or Commissioner Wells? Yeah, we welcome him aboard. So that's, that's good. Very popular. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Anything else? Commissioner Wells, anything? Move to approve. Oh. Second. I have a motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey, a second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what you're doing over there. You're, 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 you're all choppy again, Commissioner Oakley. I apologize. I couldn't <laughs> hear you again. 
It's not your fault. Uh, There's a technology uh, issue going on. I guess active hearing is what you call that. No, no, it's just it's there's a. a there's a robotic thing going on every once in a while, like your, uh, oh, it's not your fault. So. <laughs> okay. All right, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye, motion passes 4-0. Thank you. Commissioner Oakley, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll drag it out a little longer next time just to see if I see your mouth moving, and then your voice comes later sometimes. So, <laughs> again, not, not your fault, sir. Not your fault whatsoever. Are on target over it. For me, your voices are coming to me as you're speaking. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's on and off. It's your back and forth for whatever reason. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to R9. Hi, Marcy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Marcy Esberg, for the record, Director of Community Development. And we're here to uh, bring the item requested by the board about town and country villas and their loan repayment. So next slide, please. Uh, by way of background, uh, the Board of County Commissioners approved a $500,000 general fund loan to Habitat for the purchase of 42 lots in town and country villas. The loan is being paid back upon the sale of each home, and the total loan is due on 9-30-21, so about 14 months from now. Uh, to date, Habitat has purchased 45 lots, billed and sold five homes, and permitted another five homes. Uh, it is absolutely indisputable that there is an amazing uh, revitalization happening in that community that is making a big difference, not only to the people that live and work in the area, but also uh, with the police department and the sheriff's department. It, it really is, uh, the, the difference in the community is significant. Uh, currently, the loan balance that is still due to the county is $431,000 almost $432,000, next slide. So uh, I was challenged with looking for funding to repay this loan. And um, within my scope of uh, our department's budgets, I have both federal funds and state funds that I could look at. And in looking at the federal funds, um, there is a word called supplanting, and you cannot supplant state or local funds uh, with federal funds, meaning you can't take uh, the federal funds that have already been expended with state or local funds and use them. That's illegal. And then there's also the additional uh, issues of this being in a flood zone. And so then when I went to the state uh, for the SHIP program, uh, they uh, said that they, they did not think that I could use the funds retro retroactively on a project that's already been started. Um, so we could use the funds going forward. And on 630, you did approve $250,000 for new homes going up uh, in that area. So, uh, so I do not have funding within the scope of our budget that would be uh, eligible for repayment of the remainder of this loan. So next slide is the staff's recommendation is to extend the loan terms uh, to allow time for infrastructure project and the remainder of the homes to be built. Uh, I would recommend probably a three-year extension and uh, your direction to modify the loan terms. Are there questions? I'm going to pass it on to Commissioner Mariano first. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marcy. I know it's been, uh, since you've been in the position, trying to, oh. come on, John. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to, I, I know you've been working real hard to try to find a way to help this program go, and your dedication has been awesome. Kathy, you as well, trying to find ways to make this work. I know the sheriff's departments uh, and also the police department in Newport Ridge have been thrilled with what's going on out there, and the residents are, are thrilled. Um, because of the trickiness of this whole thing, uh, I think the extension is well warranted. Uh, we've got big infrastructure things to come, so that will put them in a much better position and be in good shape to help us at that point, but I think this extension is a great idea, so thanks for getting us to this point. I move to approve. Okay. So uh, motion with more discussion. And second with discussion. Um, today, uh, 
we learned that $41,000 a year is coming to us from the Newport Ritchie uh, CRA where they shrunk it down a little bit. Yeah. And I wondered if we might take that 41 and apply it to this until the loan is gone. Well, can we, I mean, as you probably know, I worked really hard behind the scenes on that um, to help get that done with that council. Um, we haven't even had a discussion yet about where the county administrator wants to use those dollars because, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah. I, I just don't, yeah, I mean. So libraries? Well, I mean. So fun. All right. Well, I, I thought that was a good, um, a good little. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if I could, please, Commissioner Stark, I, I love where you're going and what you're trying to help them, and it's, it's, and we're gonna, we're gonna succeed with this project, no question about it. I think if we keep the flexibility, we'll keep general fund money to where it is right now, knowing we we could get paid on it. If we put the infrastructure in place, if we find other ways to help them out with other monies, I think it's gonna be a better way to go. This way we can put the general fund money to wherever we want to go later on. So I, I know what you're trying to do, and I greatly, greatly appreciate it because you've been a, a great, <laughs> great help down there. So I think we just kind of like go with it the way it is. We'll put the extension out. We'll find a way to help Habitat thrive. All right, because every time they build a house on there, it's tax dollars to the county. And it cleans up the neighborhood. And, um, you know, it looks a lot better. It's not there yet. Um, but I just want to really help move this project along any way we can. And I, I, I'm all in support of helping these guys. So I see Commissioner Oakley has his hand yep, up. Yep. I'm gonna, Commissioner Oakley. Yes, sir. Well, I, agree. I, think, I think all of us are on the same page as far as helping this group. And I think when we made this loan, we were helping this group and helping the county at the same time redevelop this area. But I think they should live up to their part and pay this back through building those homes. I don't, this is general fund money. This money came from our citizens in Pasco County and it needs to be paid back to our citizens of Pasco County. And if we can find other ways to help them, that's okay. But if you want to open that, that door where this goes away without being paid back, like we agreed to do <coughs> through, I'm sure East Pasco Habitat would be more than happy to accept a $500,000 loan if you're going to forgive it. So I think we need to be careful on that. But I think the extension of this, uh, possibly a, a year extension for uh, getting the infrastructure in place that will help this area, and then another two years before, um, before we make it come due. That's, that's just my suggestion. Well, so. Thank you, Commissioner. I know Commissioner Wells is back. Did you have anything, sir? I think they have you unmuted now. I agree with Commissioner. Um, we're, we're good. I agree with, agree with Commissioner Mariano. Okay. You said you had something else, sir? Commissioner. Just to say, but to touch on Mr. Oakley's bit, um, I, I appreciate that and we want to keep it that way. And I think if we do the three-year time extension, it may take us a couple of years to get the infrastructure in place. Once they get going, we'll be able to help them out other ways too. And if you, if you look at this agreement here, this was with the West Pasco Habitat. It wasn't with Pinellas and West Pasco. Uh, when they lose 30 grand a house, you know, Mike Sutton says, look, if I had to do this project, I'd stop this project. If I wasn't so involved in it, didn't see the benefits to it. It wouldn't, it's not a good financial move for them. So he's counting on the help for us down the road. I just think the straight three-year extension as Marcy's put out is the wisest thing to do to give them time. We don't need to get the money back right away. As long as we know we're going to get it back, I think we give them the time to, to make it happen as they, as they go build like we've been doing now. Okay. Let's have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Mariano, second by Commissioner Starkey. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District, Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye, motion passes 5-0. Thank you. R10, which we're going to merge, you know, the old R7 to R10. 
Kathy Pearson, Assistant County Administrator, Public Services. Before Brian and Mar Brian Hoban and Marcy Esper come up to do the pre presentation, I just want to say thank you to the board. On May 5th, you approved the um, $4 million to be used for the PASCO CARES program. And I do want to tell you that um, this has probably been one of the most humbling and um, most emotional things that I think this group has ever gone. And I want to tell you the name is correct, PASCO Cares, because you have a team that cares. They really do. And I want to say, first of all, thank you to the IT team. When this whole project came up and we were taking, this is the rental assistance and every other bills that we were paying for our citizens, the IT team had five days to create a portal, and they did it. And, and not only did they do it, they, they, they built this jet going 1,000 miles an hour while we were still doing it, we're still building it. So I want to say thank you to them. To the public services team, not only did we pull from human services, community development, we pulled from animal services, we pulled from libraries. All these folks came together, over 40, 50 people, to process these. Unbelievable. To the fiscal team, both Christina McGonigal from uh, our public services and Jessica Blesser from our fiscal team under Eric Internal Services, again, together, to push these through to make sure our vendors were getting paid quickly. To the PIO, Tambry and her group, to the customer service team, Lisa Stinnett, to the county attorney's office, my goodness, um, Jordan Wolfgram. I'm going to miss getting her 3 o'clock in the morning emails. <laughs> Unbelievable how committed. And last but not least, to the clerk's office. They have been pumping these checks every single day for us. And if that's not a team effort to our community, Holy moly, I am so proud to be standing here and telling you this. I'm getting all teary-eyed about it. So with that said, I'm going to let Brian and Marcy give you an update of what's going to happen for phase two. They're going to give you an update of Pasco Cares, which is hopefully going bye-bye, but what the new phase two is going to look like. So with that, I think Brian is first. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Brian Hoban, Community Services Director. <laughs> you got to say it officially. So, uh, yeah, what we want to do this afternoon is um, provide an update to the board on PASCO CARES and then talk about uh, both an internal and external way forward to make sure we can continue to serve the citizens who have been affected by this pandemic and this financial hardship caused by COVID-19. Um, so if, if we go through PASCO CARES, uh, it was a program that launched on uh, May 7th, and um, the services that we provided were rental, mortgage, utilities, car payments, internet, and uh, phone bill assistance. So we offered a plethora of assistance to citizens that suffered direct, um, direct disaster or direct financial hardship, if you will, um, due to COVID-19 and the pandemic. Uh, I know there's some numbers up here on this slide that reflect the information as of July 7th, but as of this morning, we have some updated numbers. Uh, we have actually dispersed uh, over $1.9 million to over 660 households and families in need here in Pasco County. Uh, as, pa as Kathy had mentioned, uh, we are in week 10 since the launch of Pasco Cares, and we are wrapping up literally with a handful of people that are, are flowing through the clerk's office in the financial queue right now. So if we go to the next slide, we'll look at the, the ways forward that we plan on executing. Um, from an internal perspective, the human services team plans to take what we've learned through PASCO CARES and go ahead and simplify that, make our application process and the process for the community and our citizens a lot smoother. And we would like to focus um, our areas of assistance in both rental mortgage and utilities. Our plan is to open up a link for the first 150 applicants. Uh, we're, we would like to open that link on 721, so July 21st, that's a week from today. Take those 150 applicants and process them uh, as quickly as possible. Again, streamlining the processes that we've learned through PASCO CARES. The plan then is to replicate that, rinse and repeat that cycle um, till the end of the year. We're estimating that it's going to take us about three to four weeks to get through those 150 applicants, um, and, and we would like to go ahead and repeat that on a three to four week cycle all the way until the end of the year when this CARES funding uh, can no longer be utilized. Yeah, and uh, yeah, absolutely. So it's funny, Brian and I together, because it's like Mutt and Jeff. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, so uh, to follow up with um, 
Kathy's uh, original remarks about PASCO CARES. Uh, so yes, we have a county and we have um, members here that really care and care about our citizens, but the need is still very great out there and we need to start calling on our community partners to reach more and more of our citizens. So phase two, we are calling community cares. And we have already begun to uh, reach out to our nonprofit partner agencies to administer uh, this very similar program. However, we are paring it down to the basic needs of rent uh, or mortgage assistance and utility assistance, electric and water. Uh, and you approved earlier uh, in the day the templates, and we're looking to roll this program out beginning 8-1. So uh, each agency will sign an agreement uh, with us, uh, and you've given uh, County Administrator Biles the authority to sign those agreements. And they will have a choice of getting either 100,000 or 250,000, those, those are the two grant amounts um, for a monthly disbursement. So for example, if I as an agency chose 100,000, I'd be getting $20,000 a month for the next five months to go and do this assistance with citizens of Pasco County. Same thing if it's 250, it's going to be a $50,000 a month uh, we are also uh, allowing up to 20% as eligible administration expenses because that is always the key comment uh, question when you're working with nonprofits. They're, okay, we're happy to do this, but we might have to hire temporary work or expand or something like that. So we're, um, it's an eligible expense through the relief fund, so we're allowing administration uh, expenses as well. The key... Um, the key part of the relief fund, really something that the inspector general is going to be looking very closely at, is to ensure that there's no duplication of benefits. So we're going to have our partner agencies using our homeless management information system to ensure that there's no duplication of benefits so that Marcy can get her rent paid at five different agencies. Marcy can only get her rent paid at one agency. And uh, this part of the program will be administered by community development. We work with these nonprofit agencies day in and day out. This is the kind of work we do. So, so we'll be taking on this part of the program while human services continues with the direct service of community cares with individual uh, citizens. Next slide. So we're keeping some of the same parameters, 3,500 per household. It has to be US citizen and Pasco residents. And we're still serving 80% of the area median income. Uh, we did not see hardly any people of the people that we served currently that didn't income qualify. So we are definitely meeting uh, the needs of the people that are out there. And they will be self-certifying that they've experienced a hardship due to COVID-19. Next slide. So uh, this is not requiring any additional funding. Uh, as Brian said, we're just under $2 million that we've put out so far. So we're asking that we use the remainder of the $2 million, which was the initial $4 million that the board approved, continuing to, um, <clears throat> if the need is there, uh, to allow the county administrator to increase it to eight million, which was the original approval from the Board of County Commissioners. And we would continue uh, to stay according to the relief guidelines, the fund relief guidelines, to make sure that all the funds are expended by 1230. Next slide. I, I don't, next slide. I don't, so go for it. <laughs> Great job to all of you. Um, so I know that, um, you know, I had spoken with the congressman's office and got a list of, I think, 600 names that, of people who were feeling quite desperate, um, that they hadn't been able to receive their unemployment uh, funds through the state. And I think there was a concern that when, um, when the the order expires, I think it's now August 1st, that they could lose their home. So I'm concerned if we're doing, are you, if, you, if you're opening it up, well, I, you already have that list. Do, do people there 
need to reapply. Um, if there's 600 on that list, uh, and granted, you have to vet, vet everyone on that list, and there's still other citizens out in the community that didn't think to call their congressman, are we, are we, you know, are we doing enough? Because so, so again, we, <clears throat> when we start multiplying with community partners, it's not just 150. <clears throat> so all the community partners will have funding to do the exact same thing. Okay, so I thought it was <clears throat> 150 total. No, 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 no. So okay. microphones on. So really quick. So that email that email you're talking about. Brian Hoban's group is going to send a mass blast out to, we have every one of those emails, going to send a mass blast out to those folks. And Marcy is going to include some community partners so they can either go to the portal for the 150 or they can go to some not-for-profits and apply there. Good plan. And you know, not to muddy the waters, but the state also got the same relief funds. And I know that uh, we did not receive any SHIP money this year. So we were zero funded for SHIP, but they will be sending some of this relief funding down. We don't know how much. So, so we're really front loading August to December of helping people with the funding that comes in. Uh, but that SHIP money... The ship money was that the Sadowski Trust Fund money. Yeah, we did. So that's for housing, I, I guess. To to to, to make is that for, to make new housing stock? That ship money? No, it's the relief fund money. It's not ship money. It's but it's being administered by the same organization. So so yeah, the state got it, and they're they're going to be sending it to the yeah, entitlements. Yeah, but, but let's be clear that um, it's two different pots of money. So they they can't. You know, we still need the Sadowski Trust Fund money, and, um, and you can't do things with the Correct. CARES money that you could do with the SHIP money. That's so absolutely right. We're, we're, we're putting a Band-Aid on something, but once again, we're not finding the solution for, uh, you know, what I would say or in my district are all those people that are hanging out at the Wawa and, you know, living, living I, I found a gentleman living in a dumpster behind the Winn-Dixie on US-19. I mean, we're not helping those people. Like we could. That, that's not this program, but I'll bring you another program that will help. Okay, that you person. are awesome. <laughs> Mr. Mariana? Yeah. <laughs> We're having a conversation. Yeah. Um, as far as ide ideas to come forward, um, the Suncoast Recovery Center, they get, I think they've applied for permits. Is there any way you can help them? where they can actually get beds so we can get those, some of those people off the streets and get some treatment. So I will give you an update on the Sun Coast Recovery. So okay. they did put in an application under our not-for-profit. That's Marcy's handling rental. Yeah. Um, myself and Fiscal are handling the not-for-profits. They did put an application in. Okay. It is in the middle of going through a process. The process is it comes to me, it goes to our Fiscal, it goes to Jessica Blesser's group. Um, it goes to Eric Breitenbach, Assistant County Administrator, and then to Dan for final approval. So it's working its way through the process for, and I believe they apply for half a million. Wow. Okay. Um, next thing, we've got a lot of bars that are shut down. Those people are, are getting crushed. I don't know how we can reach out to those specifically to help them, knowing that they are already experienced, experienced trouble before, they're experiencing it now, and we don't know how much longer. Uh, restaurateurs, I mean, we saw Benedetto's restaurant shut down. I mean, that's, that's a guy who's got a booming business, a tre tremendous business, top quality stuff, and he can't run his business because he can't serve enough people there. He's going to take a break. Yeah. So those restaurateurs, we, we've got to try to find a way to help out. And I'll give you one other thought, if you can look into it, uh, the veterans organizations, the ones that are operating as bars or whatever, they've got food, whatever, they've been shut down. Recently, code was just out there, and they thought, they're driving by bars that are shut down, but they shut us down. What are we, what, what's going on? If you could find a way to see if we can help those organizations stay afloat too, that would be awesome. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Questions, Commissioner um, Wells, Commissioner Oakley? No, I'm good. It's a good job. Commissioner Wells, anything from you, sir? Okay. Mr. Chair? No, sir. I'm good. Yes, go ahead. I have a question. 
-hmm. So um, the program, putting it out to the nonprofits to administer the money, the funding for it, um, the Department of Treasury has provided that we have to follow CEFA standards. So are they going to be able to provide the documentation when the single audit comes around? Um, and is that going to be uh, overseen by your department? Yes, um, it's in our contract and we uh, did our preliminary discussion with nonprofits based on uh, the board's approval this afternoon. Uh, but we'll be doing monthly monitoring and asking for backup documentation and, and it's in the contract that they have to keep um, all the backup documentation and we will be training them on exactly what needs to be kept. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. All right, great, thank you. Well, without, with nothing else, we do need a motion to approve this. Oh, move to approve. Motion, motion by move Commissioner. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Starkey, second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye, aye, aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Jesus, District 4, Commissioner Wells. He's there. I don't know if he's unmuted again. Maybe. All right. Well, Commissioner Wells, I know you're there, and we can see you. All right. Uh, District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Um, I was just waiting to see if, okay. I'm sorry, if he came back on. Is he muted or? Commissioner Wells. Might have, he might have fall, fallen off. Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Oh. All right. Sorry, aye. 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 Is that an aye? Aye. <laughs> All right, okay. Motion passes 5 0. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay. Wow, look at that. We can get through a lot of items, can't we, guys? We are going to move on to miscellaneous business now, starting with Commissioner Oakley. You're up first, sir. You going to be able to hear me? I can hear you good now. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the only thing I have, well, I have, but the fact of it is uh, all of our staff, Dan Bowles and his staff, uh, our firefighters, our sheriff's office, all of the, all of the constitutionals. I mean, we've all been through a tough time with this pandemic and, and hopefully we're going to see better days in the near future. So, but I appreciate all our employees and all that, all the work they've gone through this this past year since this has happened. So, but uh, with that, I'd like to uh, send out a congratulations to Dade City Chief of Police, James Walters, celebrating his 25th anniversary today. He started as a rookie with Dade City Police Department in 1995. So his assist, um, I got a cell number here. If, if y'all would, I'll give you the cell number and you can reach him by phone and, and congratulate him. 25 years in the police department in Dade City is pretty great. So um, we got to be thankful for all their work. Little cell phones. We might want one to put that out for a police chief over uh -oh. the internet. I'll, call, I'll text it to each one of y'all so you'll have. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to make uh, sure that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. I didn't think about that. So, but. Uh, He's doing good, doing a good job here around Dade City, I, I'm telling you. So he's always there to listen when we have issues around here. So done a great job. Uh, with that, that's basically that's all I have. Commissioner Oakley, Commissioner um, Starkey. I have some photos uh, that are to be put up. So we'll see which one comes up first. I think it's going to be Cascade Park. Hopefully the before and not the after. Uh, well, okay. Is that the only one you have? So um, if you've been to Tallahassee and you go over the bridge as you approach the um, Capitol on Appalachian Parkway, you, you go over a bridge because you're going over a big um, stormwater system ditch gully, whatever, um, that, uh, that um, actually got filled in. We got a cool history um, the other day. Uh, they got filled in, and they <coughs> made this baseball field, and the, 
the county and the city had a lot of um, industrial stuff there. And um, they have a program called Blueprint 2000, which I learned about when I was on the Greenways and Trails Council. It's their penny for Leon County, actually. And they, they made a plan for trails and parks, and that's what they spend theirs on. Um, I'm not sure if that's all they spend it on, but they spend a, a lot of it on there. And they, they started working on this project called Cascade Park. And, and it's Cascade Park because there was a cascade, actually, a waterfalls going through um, this, this uh, water body back in the day before they took it out. Um, but the stormwater and parks, um, I mean, utilities and parks and others came together and worked together, pooling their resources to build this amazing park that I, I think you guys have seen called Cascade Park now in Tallahassee. So um, he was, this uh, gentleman um, was gonna come down and present to the board, uh, because I saw this at, at your, uh, at something with the Tempe um, Regional Planning Council, and I knew I wanted this presentation for us, but we, it just didn't work with all the COVID. So we, we got together with Mike Carballa, um, Keith Wiley, and uh, Branford, um, there were others, others on there and had a great, almost three hours discussion the other day, last week, about how you can bring storm, take stormwater projects and turn them into really amazing projects for the community, Utilize, if everyone pulls their resources together. Um, and uh, they showed us projects. The engineering firm was Genesis. They said they worked with you in Texas, by the way, in El Paso, uh, ha half. This, uh, this engineering firm called HALFF Engineering purchased Genesis. If you guys remember Genesis, they've been around here for a long time. They're in Tampa. Um, they've done these kind of projects all around the country. And they showed us one in, in Houston where they took a stormwater project and turned it into ball fields and trails and just improved the flooding, okay? Um, and the area still floods. They've got a skateboard park because it's all concrete. Right, concrete can go underwater and not get wrecked up. Um, so when, when that river or tributary, whatever it was, floods, the fields go under, you know, the cement benches go under, the skate park goes under, but when the flooding's gone, they clean it up and there's their park again. So they, they've stopped the, the flooding from going out into the streets. Is that the Houston? Oh, that's Capital Cascade. So they also stopped flooding here. The, the, the roads used to go underwater. Um, I don't remember the name of that road. That That's where you swings. and I went years ago. Yeah, yeah. With, with Baker. I'm just so amazed at, at, at what they took uh, as an eyesore. And the property values are through the roof around here. And that, that property where you see all the green trees, um, they've got a private developer coming in with shops and condos and lofts and all kinds of stuff that, that faces onto the park. So, uh, you know, you've heard me say it. Um, I, I think every time we look at a stormwater pond and, we're, and our utilities department is gonna be spending some money, let's take a lemon and turn it into lemonade and find a way that our residents can, can have recreation, even if it's just a simple tree-lined trail with, with benches and a, a little shaded structure um, to something like that. I mean. That was amazing. So um, I hope, I, I know Keith and Mike are, are gonna get together and do, do a little more planning. It takes, it takes plan, you've gotta plan it long term. I mean, you, you, it's not something you can do tomorrow. Keith doesn't have a whole lot of cash, but if, if when they go to design their project, and I'm thinking specifically Maggie Valley right now, if, if the parks is allowed to have input into the planning of it, even if we can't build it now, when we have the money, we can build something there. So I just really want to have this mindset. And how great would that be for that community? So, so that's a great thing that happened last week. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about was, well, our um, used car lots. And you know, this has been a real challenge for uh, code enforcement and the residents, especially in my district, and I, Jack, I see it happening on 52, and I don't know your district as well, but I'm sure it's gonna happen 301, 
some of these roads where every, you know, any business that closes the next day, it's a used car lot. I guess there takes very little to get into this business. I don't know. But this business here was a business on mile stretch that um, uh, took materials out of old TVs and sold them um, on the internet. And now he's a used car lot. And that, in your neighborhood, that just does not, that's just not acceptable. There are homes right behind him. He doesn't have that 70 foot buffer. So he's not legally supposed to be a car lot. And we, you can drive d down here at any time and they're working on the cars in the front there, which is also a violation. So um, uh, more pictures, please. Oh, I, well, I sent the uh, farm store. Okay, here's the farm store. This one popped up a couple weeks ago. Um, this, this was a, a closed up farm store on the corner of Trouble Creek and um, Grand Boulevard. And I, and then I drive by and then, whoa, there you go. It's a used car lot. So our code did go out there and told them they had to cease because they didn't have the proper permission to be a car lot. Um, but it's really, really out of control. Um, we have documented, oh, here's one on 19. This is what this looks like. Now, if you think that's good for businesses, for us to attract good business on 19, look at that. You can't even drive into that car lot. Restaurants close up, they become car lots. So uh, then there's another view of that one. So um, this, uh, me. The city of Newport Ritchie saw that this was becoming a real challenge for them and a real eyesore as they're trying to clean up their community. So they passed a moratorium. I've given you all um, an ordinance uh, about um, a moratorium on um, used. Now, theirs is new or used automobile. I, I would like for us to come back and discuss used automobile um, sales facilities, not new. When, when it's a new uh, car facility, they come in and they go through the proper process with our staff. But the, the used car lots do not. And a couple years ago, Denise and I, we held an open house in this room. We went up and down, we made a brochure, we went to every one of these, you know, sorry, illegal used car lots and said, you do not have permission to do what you're doing just because you have that, that um, little paper that you get from the state and um, come in and we'll tell you what the steps are that you have to go through to become a legal business in the field that you're, you're in. And we did have maybe 20, uh, 20 of those guys come in. I think only two stay, went through the process and became legal and the rest are still out there operating illegally. So it's more, it's more than we've been able to handle. Um, I'd like to, so I'd like to ask if you would support us talking about a moratorium while we work on fixing um, our code to um, make it uh, easier for our staff to be able to deal with this situation that's getting out of control. Um, Commissioner Stark, let me ask you a question. So, and I, and I understand what those places you're talking about. Yeah, they're all over. Setbacks and the, and the landscaping and things like that. But what about what I don't want to hurt, and anybody else can jump in on this, is I, there's some examples um, that do sell yells, used vehicles that um, have obviously done a great job going through the process. I use like Williams Automotive Group for an example over on Wesley Chapel Boulevard, um, built, you know, a building from the ground up. You can't tell if it's new or used. I mean, they still have the, the, the sh nice showroom area. Um, everything's kept up nice. And there's a few others like that. And they, they look just like, you know, new car lots. So I think there's a distinct difference between those instances and those types of facilities. Yeah, no. So, and those guys come in and go through the process. Yes. So it's these fly-by-night ones that are turning up. Yeah. We, we got another one on mile stretch in the last few weeks, and uh, they are, there are so many uh, in my district that are not supposed to be there. So how, can um, we, how, how can we look at cleaning up the areas you're, you're talking about at the same time 
not would, hurt those that are so because a loss of remember a lot of the new ones sell used too <laughs> so well I, I don't know i'd have to ask if, Jeff they have separate that. lots a lot and of maybe we too. can talk about that if yeah. we bring it back um but yeah. Um, I, I, I see them opening up. up on 41 as well. I, You're I, having that problem I, happen I, I, I on 41. I don't disagree with that. I just, I just want to make sure that we look at a way that we're not harming the ones that are going through right. the process. Right. I understand. I know Jeff, Jeff's dying to speak over there. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> so as, as I explained to the commissioner when we talked about this, uh, you can do a moratorium if you have a plan on fixing the problem through your land development code in some period of time. As I think we also talked, I'm not sure that if you do a moratorium and folks are, operate, are opening up illegally now, Stop. I'm not sure they're going to respect a moratorium any more than they're going to respect the land development code. So I think the first thing you need that code needs to identify or the planning department needs to identify is what is caught, what's the trigger? What, what is it that they're, that, why can't we do the enforcement on the ones that are opening up if they don't in fact meet the land development code? Well, and I can tell you, having worked with code on this problem for a number of years and with Christy Sims and with Patrick, Patrick and I have driven a drive-through, we've done drive-bys, we've got spreadsheets. Code's not equipped to, they don't drive by and see a new business and go, oh, I wonder if they're legal. They, that's not in their mindset. They're going to a house where someone's complained that there's trash in the front yard. It, they, don't, they don't have a person or the knowledge of how to go about to see if it's a properly placed business that's meeting all the requirements that we have. And going back to what you said about land development code, one of the reasons one of those is still open, because Christy, um, they were going to court and they had a court date, and the day before the court date, we, the staff put a hold on it because we had talked, we had a big meeting with, with Terry, and the, the issue is, on some of these is that our code requires a 70 foot buffer but from the back from the business to a residential home all right and um, we had this problem with a, a business on gun highway and in the herb you know in an urban setting like 19 well there's nobody that's going to be able to qualify for that because their lots are barely 70 feet deep so we were uh, supposed to be readjusting that part of the land development code. And also, there is a thought that, you know, maybe if, if you only have space for X, X amount of space, you can't be a, a used car lot because you physically don't have enough room for people to be able to drive in and park. Because if you drove down 19 and you looked at a lot of these, you can't even drive into the lot because all the cars are all over. There's no parking anywhere. You have to park in the middle of their, you know, you have to park behind a car in, in the middle and forget any amenities of restrooms or anything. So, um, so there are some fixes that need to happen for some of these guys to be able to even get through a process to be legal. But if they are, if there's a 75 foot setback in the code currently against residential, which there is, and they don't meet it, then they can't be there. Well, you then talk to your team because they're all over 19. They're up and down 19. And your team. Because I, I, I'm the commissioner, but I'm, I'm the one seeing, I'm the one seeing all the violations. I don't know why no one else has seen them. They're, and I get complaints all the time about what, what 19 looks like. I'm really trying to clean it up. I got a guy who's coming in spending 50 something million dollars on 19, but he don't want to see all that. You know. I'm going to go to Commissioner Mariano. If I can. I'm Jack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the troubles with code, like we went through with the with the golf course or uh, the lands, the ordinance we went through last uh, meeting, is if someone's in violation, code works them to get it into compliance. Now, by the time that could take, that could take six, seven months, and maybe. 
that's even slowing down getting them into speed as well. So it's, it's definitely going to be an issue that we, you know, can look at. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate what you're saying as far as we've got to make sure that it, look, it looks decent out there. And that's back to the landscaping as well. So And, bu and, and building maintenance. I mean, these guys, we've, look, look at what that guy was trying to do at that farm store. He wasn't improving the building at any. Right. You know, they don't, they're not an asset. And if you've watched the news, a lot of them are predatory. I'm not talking about Williams. I'm talking about these ones that rent the car, and then if you're, you know, six hours late, they come and yeah. um, possess it, and they sell it to someone else the next day. So. so you're th and again, I want to. I don't want to pick on anybody either, but s some the reports you're referring to are some of those um, buy here, pay here. Mm -hmm type of operations with very, very high interest rates right. for people, unfortunately, that, you know, they may or may not have good credit, good credit fell on hard times. And if you're, like you said, if you're a day late on the payment, they come and get the vehicle and you're, yeah. yeah. I understand that. I know exactly what you're talking about. And well, maybe, maybe, well, maybe since Mr. Steinsteiner and you guys had some nice dialogue, maybe you guys can get together and figure out if there's a way to kind of work through some of this. I, I, I mean. And I think a way through the Land Development Code that we could deal with this is a, a used car lot has to be a certain size. And then we can get rid of a lot of them. I know they're grandfathered, but if they're legal. Uh, but if they're not legal and they're not a certain size, you can't, you can't do it. So, yeah. so I think got to clean it up. I somehow. think the solution is to identify the ones the commissioner believes are illegal mm -hmm. and, and have code and planning department determine whether or not they're somehow non-conforming or whether they're truly illegal and then go through the code enforcement process. But I am not aware that we've had, we have anything pending in the county attorney's office with regard to citations for, for these, for a whole bunch of used car lots that have not been moved forward to the court system unless they're pending because of the COVID stuff. Uh, so, who in the county is responsible for oversight of this? I mean, code enforcement would check for the code violations and then work with planning and then when it became a case with the county attorney's office. <clears throat> so, since they are reactionary and not um, proactive, does someone have to make a complaint on every single car lot first for them to do it or how? How would we get them to proceed to do it? Terry's tr trying to say, are you wanting to say something? <laughs> Terry, do you want to come to the podium? That's a lot of work for code because they're all over the county. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot of work for any department. Yeah, I but mean, it's it, a problem. It, we look like Yeehaw Junction out there. We only have one stoplight, don't they? <laughs> yeah, but Commissioner, the only thing I'm trying to say <laughs> yeah. is a moratorium is not going to help you yeah. if your issue is enforcement. Well, I think it stops uh, Benedetto's from being a car lot. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's a good site for a car lot. I don't know. But. Um, Terry, do you have anything you'd like to add at this time? or uh, To the point of uh, size and uh, setting a threshold, a lot of the uh, used car lots are happening in C2 zoning districts, and the minimum lot size is about 15,000 square feet. That's for C2 zoning. Um, the, uh, the current restrictions in the land development code for, for car dealerships in the C2 zones is that they typically have to have either a PD future land use, an ROR future land use, or a COM future land use accompanying them. So that kind of narrows the window a little bit in terms of what C2 zoning districts can uh, accommodate um, the car dealerships. So you have to put those two things together when you think about uh, the size restriction. So 15,000 square feet is, is, is a small, it's a fairly small lot when you're looking at commercial property. Oh, yeah, for sure. Are you saying they can be a used car lot if it's 15,000? That's the minimum area of a uh, C2 lot. Okay. It must be at least 15,000 in order to be well, zoned C2. Code's going to have to look up the lot size. However you do that, I don't know how you do that. But I just... Mark, our GIS has a, has a lot size on there. We can go to the property appraiser's website and get the information, too. So, well, but I mean, 
they all they are working a priority process, and I would say you know yeah. So I so Carl falls to the bottom. Health and safety. So right, and so therefore I have these proliferating and the problems getting worse and worse and worse. I mean they're coming up, they're coming up Grand Boulevard. Like I said, we got a third one on Mile Stretch when I already had two illegal ones, and I have a third one, and one of the ones on Mile Stretch at the corner of Mile Stretch and Grand, he's nowhere near 15,000 square feet. He might be. 3,000 square feet, but he did put some landscaping in anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, there's, um, so I'm wondering how he even got, th got through th with Denise's people if you have to be that size to be a car lot. But uh, they're, com they're coming everywhere. They're coming everywhere, and I think we really need to pay attention to it. Well, why don't, can I make one more suggestion? Yeah. It's what about, and I, and I apologize, I forgot the name of it, the special code enforcement team that we have teamed up with HRE. the SO and the attorney attorney's office. We call that what? HRE. 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 Yeah. Maybe that needs to go that route. For a little while, that, that would be great if they could get it. Yeah. I mean, some of them. I mean, I know I have 60 in my area, but um, I don't, you know, 52 and 41. I, I haven't driven 41 yeah. lately. There's some of 41. Yeah. But last time I saw a bunch popping up on yeah. uh, there. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, Doing any business that closes up, it becomes a used car lot. Yeah. It's it's amazing. Yep, I understand. Okay, well, I think I got my message. Great. Thank <laughs> you, ma'am. Commissioner Mariano. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm looking to my left. I'm sorry, Commissioner Wells. Commissioner Wells. Sorry, I'm not there, but we would not be social distancing, so. Yeah. Just saying. Um, and just, just to address Commissioner Starkey's um, comment about Magnolia Valley, um, Keith Wiley is very engaged with Mike Carballa's team and the engineers um, with Magnolia Valley. Um, I absolutely agree with what you were saying. I absolutely agree with the concept in Tallahassee. I've been there. I think it'd be great. But yes, Keith is engaged there. That's, that's the plan. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. But yeah, Keith, Keith, like I said, if anything, he's probably too engaged, but that's a good thing because we should all be on the same page, every department with any stormwater project. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I got a couple things. I have to reinstate, uh, Gail. Hey, um, can I, can I, can I talk Go to you ahead. about your comment that you just I, made? Just cause yes. I've been working with Keith on this and I know that Keith is very uh, supportive of this idea, but I think it would be wonderful if the commissioner spoke up that they think utilities and parks should move together in this kind of direction. They, they are. They, they are. They, they absolutely are. are. Um, it's not just this, but they absolutely are. Um, I talk to Keith and Mike on this I think monthly. Okay, um, well, we'll talk off, off the line. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um, just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that. So there, and Dan is aware of it too. Dan knows it's, it's again, it's going to be a great project when it's done. So um, going back to the commission uh, status of women, I need to make a motion to reinstate Gail Armstrong or just continue her service on that board. Do I need a motion for that, Jeff? Yes. Okay, so that's my motion. Second. I have a uh, I have a motion by Commissioner Wells, a second by Commissioner Mariano to reinstate, and, and forgive me, the name again? Gail Armstrong. Gail Armstrong. To the yeah. status for women. Okay. Um, Madam Clerk. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, and I, I had some veterans reach out on a road. I believe it's in Commissioner Mariano's district. It's uh, Formal Avenue. Um, it needs to, it needs a one-time fix on it. Uh, the, the estimated expense for that one-time fix is $4,500. I need to make a motion to get approval to do a one-time fix on Formal Avenue, if I could, please. So that's your motion. Second. I have, a, so I have a motion by Commissioner Wells, a second by Commissioner Mariano. Mr. Chairman. Yes. County Administrator, did, do you know about, is this a public road? That's my only concern. I'd have to look. I did not see this request. So. 
Okay. So well, he it, has an amount, so somebody's seen it because he has a dollar. Right. Amount. Yeah, I'm sure he got it from Public Works, and so I just I just don't have. So the, if if the if the board would approve it, subject to the county attorney's review about whether it's a public or private street, you can't spend money on a pri private street. That's okay. my only concern. Thanks. You hear that, Commissioner Wells? I'm aware, but it went through the process, so I find it hard to believe that Dan's not aware of it because I thought it has to go to before it comes to us. But okay, that's fine. Okay, so I have a motion by Commissioner Wells, a second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye, motion passes 5-0, thank you. Sir, anything else? Yes, I only have 10 more items, so just give me a minute. All I'm right, kidding. sounds good. I'm I'll sit back. I've got two more. So, um, Orchid Lake, you know, we've approved several PVAS projects in Orchid Lake. And one of the concerns or one of the opportunities, I believe, is you know, the way the PVAS works is, you know, we've got a petitioner coming in and then they're approving, let's say, three or four roads, which leave three or four roads not done. So we approved um, um, Village 6. So that's already been approved. I would like to do a board initiated um, paving assessment or at least have, a, have them bring it back to us, which is going to save everybody money for work at Lake Village. Um, I don't know that I need to do a, do a motion on that, Jeff, but I know I at least want to make sure the board's okay with me having Ainsley bring, go through the process and bring that back to us for a board initiated uh, paving assessment. You don't need a you don't need a motion if it's going to come back to the board as a board initiated. That would be the opportunity for the board to act on it. Okay, I just want to make sure that the board's okay with that. It just yeah. it's doesn't make sense to me that we're you know we have somebody petition, but we've got roads right next to it that aren't being done. It's a public safety you know deal. So okay. if the board's okay, with it. so that's the direction you're giving staff. You're asking staff. He's Dan's taking his head yes. So you, that's your direction to staff. They will bring that back, sir. Yes, that'd be awesome. Okay. Um, and the last thing is, um, I've been working with Aristida. I know that's Commissioner Starkey's second home that she lives back there. So I know, I believe she's up to speed on this, but I've been working with Aristida for uh, a year or two. You know, we tried to do a paving assessment in there that was too much money. It failed. So now I've, I've been meeting with the HOA board. Uh, they decided they want to do a micro surfacing in there, which we're going to handle like a paving assessment. So I need a motion for the board to approve a micro thing in the amount of, uh, it's like $167,000, about $1,300 a lot. Uh, need a motion on that, Jeff, or can I just have them bring it back to us? I, I, yeah, I would, I would have okay. the administrator do an agenda item and bring the details of that back. Okay, so we can talk about it more, but I, you know, Commissioner Starkey lives in there. She knows what the roads are like. Um, I'm sure she agrees I, with this. I voted for Something. the PVAS. Yeah. Well, the, the, the actual PVAS failed um, when we petitioned everybody, which was like 11. I think it went up to like 16,000 a, a lot. So they decided the microsurfacing. The board had a meeting last night. They approve it. Um, so I'll have, I'll have Ainsley bring it back to us maybe at the next meeting and we can get this ball moving. So okay. that, that's it. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Um, Commissioner Mariano, looking at my row here. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, on the um, good note, the FGOA system that we took over Jasmine Lakes, Palm Terrace, and Zephyr Shores, they are absolutely ecstatic. Oh, awesome. They got their first bills, and <coughs> one of the emails was like, I had a, had a bill at $200, now it's down to 70 Someone else had one for 150 it was down to like 50 or something. So. They are absolutely thrilled with what we're doing. Um, and as you mentioned, trying to cooperate with parks, when ULI came to see us years ago, they said, trying to work your stormwater into your parks too. And Cascades, we went to the Edison for uh, Lauren's graduation up there. We were up there. Oh. So yeah, it was, it was, the kids love the park there too. But I think we can probably do some nice things in there. At the Restart Committee we just had, um, we talked about that a little bit. So. We couldn't vote on anything, but we're going to probably look at that a little bit closer too as staff gets further down the road to try to improve that park. We could probably put a dog park in there, probably half a beach volleyball court, and build it just low enough where on a big storm event, yeah. it'll take the storm, it'll percolate, 
and keep everybody from Coventry on one side and to the north on Nome uh, a little bit safer too. So um, the Dr. Blanco, um, Terry is still here. Um, so Dr. Blanco has been probably the biggest economic development guy years from, from me first getting on the board years ago by trying to push to push to make sure we did things right down the 54 corridor, every employment center. And he was told that, and he's been trying to hold on for the, a big company coming in. And he was recently told that if he wanted to have a company coming in, he's going to have to allow for multifamily to go in a certain section of the property. And he says, I don't want to do that. What can I do? I says, well, I said, I think we're probably trying to do something good there. But if you had someone coming in there, I wouldn't want to make that requirement on you or anybody else in any employment center that if you could bring a, restrict you from bringing a, bringing a bigger company in. So he, had, he met with staff, I think it was yesterday, and he left shaking his head saying, I got to go spend $3,000 to go get this change so I can actually not have multifamily in there. I said, I don't think the board wants to put you or anyone else in that situation. So I was going to bring it up before the board, coincidentally with this item being pulled, was part of the conversation. So Terry, I sent you an email asking you to forget some verbiage, but do you want to come up and address that issue a little bit for how the, how the meeting went and what you think we can do? Not only for him, but for everybody else in an employment center facility. Nectarios uh, Pitos, Planning and Development. Um, so with regard to the meeting with um, Dr. Blanco, uh, he has a property that's, uh, I believe, on the northeast corner, essentially, of Sun Coast in 54. Um, it is designated at uh, future land use as EC Employment Center. And along the 54-56 corridor, this is probably the, the only point where there is a concentration of EC right on the 54-56 corridor. Um, yeah. What we talked about with Dr. Blanco yesterday was essentially uh, a potential comprehensive plan amendment, small scale, to amend uh, approximately 8 to 10 acres of his 28-acre EC uh, future land use property uh, to office. Uh, that would enable him to continue with the economic development strategy that the county has for that corner. Um, and it would essentially uh, leave approximately 20 acres or less to the EC flu. Now, as a uh, recorded lot, as of, I believe, January 2007, um, he is, that property is applicable to a provision within the EC flu that says that if you're 20 acres or less, um, you do not have to follow the multifamily requirement. You're exempt from it, essentially. But it requires a, a comprehensive plan amendment uh, to take eight or ten acres, turn it into office, and then he would be exempted from the multifamily. Conversely, um, you could go into the EC flu itself and begin to make changes to the language of the EC flu. Um, but the key thing to keep in mind with that is that the EC flu is uh, applicable countywide, so there are numerous policies across the comprehensive plan that are connected to the EC flu that are impacting other locations in the county. Um, and also a text amendment of that sort would probably take uh, six to eight months to do because of the analysis, but also because of the process that would be involved to bring it uh, to the LPA and to the BCC twice in transmittal hearings and adoption hearings, et cetera, as opposed to a small-scale comprehensive plan amendment uh, for this particular property to surgically address the issue for Dr. Blanco specifically. Um, that process would only take three to four months. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So I, I think this board has done a phenomenal job working on economic development, the jobs we brought in here, and right across the way was the touch point project that came in. And they were going to build even more, well, we had it set where they could actually have more commercial in there. They went more, more residential because it worked for that project. I think that we need to go change this, and I want to do as quick as we can at the same time if he's got a, someone that comes in with interest. If they know it's only six or eight months away, I think we're still going to be okay for that process to go through. But I think every single person with an EC property that wants to go straight with larger without, without yeah. you know, multifamily, I'm, a good, I'm good with that. I don't want to restrict that. And had, frankly, had I known it was actually laid out there, I don't think I would have supported that concept of it. So, you know, got past me. And maybe it was just a good talk about, you know, how we like live, work, and play in the same area. But seeing as we've seen things develop in the past few years, People are going to go where they want to go with what they've got. They're going to work it. But I don't want to restrict anybody with right. EC not to be able to create more jobs. That's, 
Commissioner, I can agree more with you. It's a great point, especially when you think about how much housing is available in those areas. When we talk about oversaturation of the product you're talking about, there's, there's, I, I agree. Do we want apartments or 500 more jobs? I'll, I'll, go, with the, I'll go with the jobs. It's not hard <laughs> to figure out, right? I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. So, I'm, I, I, is your direction to ask them to bring? something back to change I'll, I'll make a motion that you bring back uh, an agenda item for the board to look at to go through the process of changing everybody with an EC development to be able to avoid multifamily if they so choose. No, if I might add. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, the longstanding policy of the, of the county has been to, at least with the Employment Center Future Land Use, to try to put uh, jobs and places of residence closer together to have less of an impact on transportation networks, to optimize uh, existing infrastructure. Um, and there should be a little bit of a departure from, from that longstanding policy. Yeah, I think, sorry, I'm not trying to take your show here, but um, considering how much housing we have up and down that corridor already, I think you've pretty much surpassed that. I mean, you know what I mean? I think we've, uh, I think I mean, we got it. No. And, you know, I will tell you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Even on the west side, if I had someone who wanted to come in and do that, I wouldn't want to restrict that person either. I don't disagree, because there's a bring lot the, of neighborhoods jobs, around there. Well, bring the jobs, yeah. the housing will follow. Bring yeah. the jobs. I, I understand. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure that I understand. You're, you're, yeah. in, you're aware that in terms of the comprehensive plan, the transit emphasis corridors and the transit center overlays that we have within the comprehensive plan that rely on the EC in, in, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases. Yeah. Um, the whole point is to establish that, that transit emphasis, the density, which I understand has been in discussion of late. Yeah. Um, the density that exists currently on the 5456 corridor, by, by some of the estimations that we've had, have, has only amounted to about four dwelling units per acre on the corridor which is not near uh, the transit supporting capability of um, <laughs> to, to essentially to support the, the bus routes, et cetera, that we might want along 5456. So what, what that could lead to is uh, an increase in congestion on these thoroughfares. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna agree. disagree with that. And, totally. you know, if we, we maybe need to have a workshop to understand why our comp plan is set up the way it is. Maybe we bring ULI back in here. Um, there's a reason why we w went through a lot of work to do the things that we did. We only have two east-west roads. I mean, we have to be, be careful. You can, I recently drove to northern Georgia, and if you said you'd driven up there, I mean, they have done a horrendous job of controlling sprawl, horrendous. And um, the congestion is crazy, and it, there's, there's planning reasons why we've made the decisions that we did. And I think because we see some apartment complexes along the road there in 56, um, we're making some knee-jerk reactions. And I think we need to look at some stats to understand is perception really reality? And so I would not want to start messing with major comp plan and land use changes like that until, unless we had a workshop. Commissioner Mariana. And I'm, I'm good with the workshop, but I will tell you, here's my, here's my thinking. When, when I first came on the board, that high point center wasn't even a, not, a mark for EC. I asked to get that put on there, that got put on there. So, I mean, I, I want to pick every single corner we can, every single of these crossways to make them all happen. And I think that we all expected, in, in good talk, to have live, work, and play in the same area. What we've seen, though, is we've seen these apartments will go where they want to go, Family Hill's going to go where they want to go. They're on that corridor right now. I am. I don't think it's going to affect that many places, frankly, with, with, with this. I know it's going to affect him, but I don't want to affect anybody else either. And if I've got 56% of my population still going south yep. to go work, yep. I want to put the congestion right here on that road, but at least it's a lot quicker of a drive right for that area. Let them go work in our county than down the street. So well, if I can add every single job I can, I, I, I can want them see all. on Blanco's corner that that... Yeah that I wouldn't want to keep a big business coming in because of this housing part. And as you know, if they could connect in the back to Bexley, Bexley and right to those apartments that are going to be baking next to that unlandscaped parking lot, um, 
they choose to live there, um, yeah, there should be a connection there. So there's a, maybe enough nexus around it. But let's just not start changing our plan up here without understanding the consequences and the, and the data. Yeah, well, I don't, again, I don't want to, I won't continue a debate or really want to get into a debate here, but um, conversations I've had in the past, I had during the, the workshop previously, is that um, when some of these policies were implemented, you know, to be a transit-oriented corridor, how's that worked out? And let's just be honest. Mm -hmm. So cart before the horse, man. You put the, why isn't the transit there before? So, so, well, I, I'm not, so, sh that, again, I don't want to get into a long debate about this here, but show me where the, on the plans for the next 10, 15, 20 years, where we're going to have that transit along that corridor, and then maybe I'll bite. But guess what? There's no plan. There's no funding. It's not there. Essentially, what, in my opinion, what you're doing is you're, it's no difference because, because those same people are, a lot of them are living in the communities off, say, well, I'll use 54, 56, or 52, for example. When they're driving, they're probably driving farther on those roads, and then they're hopping on 75 or 275 to go north, south, east, west, wherever they're going, and they're not coming back on the same road anyways. So that traffic is still there. They're just driving a longer distance on those roads, actually, in my opinion, affecting the roads even more because they're driving further. So I, I mean, I... I, 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 did, I, did it, I did it for years myself when I first moved to Pasco County. I mean, it's no secret that it, I, I moved from Hillsborough County to Pasco County for good reasons, but I still own a company that I drove to every day in Hillsborough County and would drive to Hillsborough County from my office in the Temple Terrace area. Along, I would go to South County, I would go to downtown, and I would come right back to Pasco County and drive that same stretch of 54, 56. So I was still that guy on the road. I was just going further. <laughs> so, so if somebody's living somewhere and already in Pasco County, we have a business here, and they're not having to take that long route, it just makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, anyways. You know, I don't want to get into a long one on this. I mean, just common sense. But Terry wants to say something. Yeah, one more thing, and let's move on. Sir, so, yeah, go ahead. Oh, let me get Commissioner Wells go. Go ahead, sir. If I could, real quick, and this is in my district. I'm very familiar with it. Um, okay. I absolutely, positively, 100% agree with Commissioner Mariano. Um, if that's the wish of the board and Commissioner Mariano, you're okay with the, doing a workshop. I'm okay with that. But I absolutely, positively agree with you on this, um, 100%. And I'm with you on it. All right. Thank you, sir. So, what do we uh, do? We need direction, or do we? You, you had something else, Terry. You had something else you want to add, or well, just a little bit of perspective. Um, and but again, I want to get into a debate on the issue if we're going to bring it back. So correct. No, I understand. Okay. Just, just a just a thought to put out. There okay, sure. From a anchoring standpoint, what we do have in the region, uh, the regional rapid transit planning activities that are going to essentially connect St. Petersburg downtown with Leslie Chapel. Correct. Um, what you have there is the beginnings of a good network that can span the 54, 56 corridor east and west and make transit connections into the regional system mm -hmm. and allow the regional system to access uh, Pasco County um, when people do arrive from wherever they're coming from in the Tampa Bay region into Wesley Chapel. They can get onto P a PCPT route and head west on 54 to the businesses and what have you that are, that are down the road as well. So the... Yes, in a sense, uh, I would maybe agree with you a little bit that the cart was ahead of the horse, but it is a sort of chicken and the egg thing, which comes first. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have a, a point of reference at this point in time with regard to the regional rapid transit system. And so we want to be able to uh, maximize that because there may be some people who will come into Pasco County to actually work here using oh, the, yeah. the rapid transit system. Listen, I'm with you. I've been a supporter of the BRT for a, a long time. But again, let's talk about when that's going to actually take place and be finished. How many years? We're Possibly. Now, yeah. So before he got here, I'm just giving us whether that's it's ancillary yeah, feedback, you know. So and then so you have the time to. Well, I, the company wants to bring a few hundred jobs. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's bring them. Don't twist my arm. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah I mean, so what do you, what would you like to do, sir? I would like to bring it back for a workshop and. Well, I think we're all in agreement on the Blanco piece. I don't know if you need a workshop on that. Is there a motion that you can 
Well, do I, we need I, a motion? But, but as much as I just know Dr. Dr. Blanco's thing, I, I think if anybody wants to bring more jobs as opposed to multifamily, give them the option. Let them. Well, go. let okay. That not, not changing them. the whole thing. Let's we need to workshop that. But I'm, if, I'm good. If, let's but do work. we need to do something to help Dr. Blanco today? I don't think so because I think if he knows and and anyone he would have come in, it's going to take him a while to come in anyway. And I think oh, if they know, yet? Okay. Uh, you know, if they know we're working toward this here, that's mm -hmm. good. And I, th I think if he knows that we can always change it right away, mm -hmm. then well, three to four months instead of six months, I think it'd be okay with that. But I think if we're making that direction, I'd like to took it the whole look at it, the whole thing holistically anyway. Right. Let's face it, the way we were told things may develop down there has been a little bit different. Let's right. just see if we can tweak it a little bit better, make it better. Now let's go do it. So I'm happy with the workshop. So uh, just to repeat, so I understand. Workshop, the EC Employment Center, future land use, uh, and in particular the proportions of the land uses that are within. Nothing. That. What, whatever they have, if they have EC, if they don't want to put in multifamily, we don't make them. We can make them. We'll talk about connecting them to what's around it. That's well, fine. Let's have that debate. I just, but I just the don't need to see the pros and cons. Yeah. I mean, I need to see. So what's, yeah. that's the discussion. You know that's why we're going to have a workshop to have those discussions. Then, so let's. Is that okay? That's good. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So there's a direction. Work with staff, and we can set that up. Beautiful. Okay. Anything else, sir? Uh, yes, a couple of things. Um, you've had that picture up four times already <laughs> on Hudson Beach. So this Hudson Beach, and I think it's like 1970-ish, maybe 80-ish, and you see the white beach all the way around. Um, I would like us to take a look at going back to that, and I think if you look at the you get a pointer. All right, if you look to where the furthest on the left of the screen, the top, the higher up on the screen, there's a big, big sand berm that's down there. All that is, a lot of that sand is like eroded from where the pavilion is at the far lower corner. It moves all down there. Everything that was in here before is sand. I'm looking to go pretty much where you can see where the water level is or where the white sand is, is around that whole edge to go put a call it a footer, call it a seawall, uh, about three feet high, which will raise up everything so that on a high tide situation, the beach will still remain. It won't erode away. On the outside part, you can't quite see it with the whole picture, but with the outside part of the back of the channel, especially on the lower part of the screen, which is kind of cut off, we would take that and make that a deep swimming area. By the pavilion area on the lower left side, we'd have like a boating marina type thing. We could put about 20, marine, 20 boats on there put a jetty going across where you can walk back and forth so you can go to the beach, go to the restaurants, and come back on. Um, the people that are down to the northern part, there's two channels there. There's an old channel that's diagonally set up that DEP says they've got the map of. We haven't seen it yet. It connects out the Hudson Channel. So everybody to the north will connect that way. Everybody connects down over here. And what we've done is now we've created a waterfront area. We've created a beach area. And I think we've We've dramatically improved Hudson. Um, I've had a couple of folks out there to look at it. It may take as little as $50,000 to do the engineering. We're not sure yet. Um, but I just want that on your radar right now because I want to try to get Keith Wiley and I've talked with him. We already talked about doing the lower part already. And once you've done the one part of engineering, it's pretty much lay the bricks over the next room to do the rest of it. But I will get something to bring back to the board to kind of show you that. And we, we will need to move quick on it. Because if we're going to do the dredging, if we don't have to get rid of the spoils and we can put the spoils right under the beach, it cuts the cost down and improves the beach for, for an asset as well. How does that, how's that sound, everybody? Well, I have no idea what kind of cost you're talking about, where in the budget plan it is. I mean, it's, it, it sounds, I mean, it's always good to have a beach in Pasco County, but. The devil's in the numbers and, and, you know, are you going to cut out another project in your district or where, where's the money going to come from? I don't, I don't know. So I will I'll tell you, this product, product I think could be phenomenal. I would like to take, take a look at the numbers too. That's when we get the engineering done. So coming back, the first thing I'll come back with what the engineering will be. And then from there, we can go look at it because the timing's going to be really good because of September, uh -huh. there's going to be time when we start, hopefully look, look at going out for a bit on the dredge because we should have the numbers as well. Dan, you want to say? Well, just th this work is not in Keith's CIP program. 
you know, it's, it's not in the go bond where he had money for those kinds of things. So, and I don't believe it's on his parks master plan. So I'm not sure, you know, there, there's no funding there for this. So, you know, we'd have to come up with a, a funding source from somewhere else to, to move forward. Well, and again, talk, and, and talking to Keith, with the cuts that were done pre-COVID, et cetera, we had talked about this lower part with the jetty already about doing that. Um, and maybe with the cuts that were coming through, we had to pull it back. As you, you told me, I think it had to cut down 450 grand out of his budget. So, but I've, cut, I've not seen that in a in a plan anywhere to spend <coughs> half a million on a jetty. Well, and it, well, half a million. I don't know. Like I said, I don't know what the number is going to be, but that one part down there where the sand goes into the channel, blocking the channel, he was going to do that anyway. It was going to shut the beach down for, you know, it could have been two months, three months anyway. So. Doing the engineering for that was probably very close to what this is here. And we can look for different ways to go fund it. But I will tell you, but the jetty alone, just for the dredging costs coming up, could well, well pay for itself in value. And, and again, just doing the engineering is the first thing I want to get ready. And that's why I want to bring it up today, was if we get the engineering part done, then we can go find out where the costs are and figure out how to go pay for it, one way or the other. Can, can I ask one question or maybe a, make a suggestion because mm -hmm. it was I saw this this weekend I was actually I don't know if I was gonna bring it up today I was gonna bring it up at some point but um, I was down in Venice this past weekend and if you know that area they have a jetty and I was talking to some of the gentlemen at the marina actually um, and they were tell, showing me how they, they were in the process of about to dredge this area um, I don't know if, if everybody's on that I don't know how accurate this information is, but he mentioned Army Corps of Engineers mm -hmm. doing this project. Yeah. So um, hard to explain without seeing it, but it's close to the jetty. So it would be, um, I don't know, probably about um, 2,000 2, feet from where the, the jetty opens up into the Gulf. Um, and they have, a, I would call it island or a spoil island already there. They're going to dredge some of the residential canals. They're going to dump that, obviously, silt, sand, whatever, back onto that island. And that's kind of the area where all the locals hang out. You know the area, right? You know the area. Um, a lot of the locals hang out in that area on their boats on the weekends and stuff, kind of like they hang out in the sandbars here in Pasco County. I'm just making that suggestion, maybe look into that, see what their funding source was, see if it is Army Corps, why is Army Corps doing that? Because they, they did mention it was going into residential canals. Um, what are they, where do they see the benefit? Maybe there's also a funding source there. Yeah, that's it. And it could be if we, if we take the Hudson Channel, we make it like, I think it's 11 feet deep. Once that's done, that even takes the maintenance away too. Yeah. So that is something we're going to go look at the whole thing. Take a gander what they're exactly doing down there and where they're getting the okay. money. Yeah. With Venice? Okay. Yeah, Venice. When, so there's where the inlet is, um, right kind of in the middle. It goes from county to city. So I don't know who's actually in charge of the project, but it's um, you have city on one half of the channel, kind of like yeah. um, Anclo, right? So part's yeah. Pasco, Pass part is, uh, yeah. is Pinellas. So. Mr. But, Chairman, yeah. the, yes, sir. that whole longshore transport of sand mm -hmm. along the Gulf Coast, uh, it, they are constantly doing core renourishment yep. dredge projects right. to keep the inlets clean yeah. and the beach is there. Yeah, yeah. And so that's I, all. Yeah. And that's always been a that that's always yeah. been the Corps of Engineers project. Well, they should oh, cool. keep our beach there. Yeah. So it's something to look at too, because this was a little deeper end. It's going into some of those residentials. You know what I'm talking about? So yeah, good good thoughts though. Yeah, and that, and that could work. And, and again, with part of the funding part and the approval parts of the Army Corps and DEP is because that beach was a beach before, and now we're going to try to improve it and restore it. Uh, they think the permitting will actually be pretty easy for it. All right. Um, the boat lift covers. Um, we, we saw someone com comment on that today. Um, I think the previous meeting, someone's commented on it. People really want to see it happen. Jeff, is that coming back to us soon? Not really. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Next time, is Pito's planning to do A little bit. A little bit. Um, we are working on that actively right now in the planning and development department. Um, we had a couple other priorities ahead of that one, um, but we are on it. Uh, currently anticipating bringing that to the board uh, 
in the December time frame, December, January time frame. I have to check with staff to be certain. But um, we are going to be bringing it to the before the board um, in a little bit of time here. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I want you to miss this last one. That's all right. Um, on COVID, um, there's a report that just came out the 14th. Um, it says the Florida Department of Health leaves its, released this daily coronavirus testing report showing a statewide positivity rate of 11%. But Fox 35 noticed that some shocking positivity rates. Uh, the Florida Department of Health showed that they had a lot of labs that were 100% over, I mean, 100% positive. There's a list of those labs. I can pass them down here. Right. So there's definitely some conflict that's out there, and I want us to take a close look at this data that's out there. Um, and I got some good news as far as COVID goes, um, I think, and we'll have to see. It's getting researched. I've actually had someone who lives in the area in Texas, Odessa, Texas, but there's a doctor, Richard Bartlett, that's got this budesonide using zinc um, that he's been treating his patient with. He's had great success with it. Mm. And it's a, you, you'll know this better than me, so. Yeah, yeah. It's a, like a steroid mm -hmm. with a nebulizer yeah. that goes in, Nebulation. weakens everything down, and people instantly feel better. Um, he's been doing it, and there's another guy in another part of Texas been doing it. Uh, they say they were doing it in Taiwan. And if you know, if you, Taiwan has got 225 million people. They had seven cases of death. Japan, I think, had like under 1,000. Um, I don't know how much was intense with what they did with that, but that was one of the things that was mentioned uh, in his comments. So I think it's something for us to go take a look at, take a look at the data that's just out. There's a lot of new stuff that's just coming out here. I've actually sent it up to, to our staff as well as up in Florida, the state of Florida, to kind of go look at this to see what's relevant and what's real and go look at it. But just want everyone to keep, keep an eye on this every step of the way. Thank you. So have. what are you showing us here? Those, those labs we're doing the testing, and part of the reason we think we might have seen the spike, those labs reported every one of those where every single test they took, everyone was positive. Okay, every so one of those I tests. I am friends with the CEO of Tampa General, mm -hmm. John Corris. He yeah. used to be the CEO of North Bay. Yeah. I see that Tampa General is on here, um, number 35. So I'm going to ask him for clarification. I also see. Uh, Morton Plant is on here, and James Haley's on here. I'm trying to see if there's any other ones right around here that we would know any of these folks. Let's see what this means. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm texting this to John now. So. That again, just okay. it's you know we can't talk as the sunshine law, but I wanted to share this with you. I appreciate, by the way, Dan, the code report we had yesterday was good. So I appreciate the information, but I just wanted to share that information that's come up since then. As we go forward, thank you. Uh, that's sir. all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Biles. Yes, sir. I just wanted to update you on our CARES expenditures today. We have a report that's due to Treasury at the end of the week, and through the end of June, we had expensed about twenty-nine point seven million, and then we approved the board approved today another six million for CARES. So, just kind of wanted to get you an update. There's a lot going on, a lot of work happening across across the county with that. So just kind of want to give you an update on that and where we are. Thank you, sir. Mr. Steinsteiner. Mr. Chairman, if I could get a motion to authorize you to sign a letter to Judge Sestak uh, appointing Commissioner Wells as your representative for the canvassing board for the uh, general election. He has agreed with the supervisor to provide oh, yeah. his services, okay. but we need to we need to provide that that's a board action um, to the canvassing board. Okay, so so I got a motion, and you said Commissioner Wells is okay with it. Yes. Okay, I have a motion then. Second. We have a second. A motion by Commissioner Marion, second by Commissioner Starkey. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District One, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. I think we, we got dropped. Hey, great timing. I waited till he got off. <laughs> <laughs> District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. 
Aye. Motion passes 4-0. And we have a standard letter I'll, I'll prepare for the chairman's signature. Okay. So you have it ready now? No, I don't have it right okay. now, but I, I will, I'll get it to you. Okay. Um, and if I could get clarification on one of your previous actions, um, the habitat um, motion, uh, was that three years from when it expired in 2021, or was that three years from today? The, it wasn't clear from the memo. That's why I'm asking the question. But the but the balloon note ended September of 2021, I believe. I I took that your motion as to be three years from when it would have expired. But just for clarity, for the for the clerk, you know, and I, my assistant that worked on it, ish, asked me the question. So, but that. That is the intent of the board is is to move that 2021 deadline out three years, correct? That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, um, Madam Clerk, anything on your side? Yes, um, I wanted to thank um, Kath, or Kathy in regards to um, the recognition for the CARES Act money and our, our office is working really well together. It is um, a perfect example of not just multiple departments working well together, but multiple agencies working well together for the benefit of our, our citizens. It has um, been pretty labor intensive and um, I know on both sides. And um, I, I greatly appreciate the, the recognition for my team as well as for yours and, and the other departments as well. Um, our office has been processing checks every single day. And from the time that we get the packet from the county, um, from the time of processing to the time of the check cutting, it is less than two business days that we oh, are turning you. that around. Good for you. Right. That's great. Um, and it has been long hours for both the county as well as, as my office, but we know that it is to help our citizens. So we're all in and we're all in it together. And to kind of give you an example, a application could be from five pages to 60 pages, and it entails a lot of detail and information and double checking. And it also entails fielding phone calls from the applicant, wondering where it's the status of get, getting paid, can I get a copy of the check because they want it for their records, to calling the vendors, ensuring that the payment information is correct and answering any questions. So it has been a lot of work, but it has been extremely beneficial, I think both for our offices and in uh, working well together as well as to our community. So I just wanted to say it's just been, it was, it's a shiny example of government working well for its community. Excellent. Thank you. Very proud of everybody. Yeah, yes, proud of everybody. Good. Okay, um, I just I do have a couple things that I need to bring up. First, I'm gonna um, look at, okay, I got you, buddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's an update. That, uh, yeah, there's an update on the memorial, but it's more appropriate for Commissioner Oakley because of all his hard work and efforts he's put into it to actually do that. So I'm gonna let him do the update on the memorial at the historic courthouse. All right, thank you. I, uh, I know I brought it to your attention about two weeks ago that uh, I had uh, started a donation promise from uh, about 18 people, five grand a piece, and that's gonna give us enough money to finish the uh, fallen officer memorial. So once I collect that money and all and get it to the committee that's in charge of that, then that should come to fruition. So about a week and a half to, to draw that, at least 90,000. I hope there will be a little bit more than that by the time we uh, collect the money. So it's very good and very good for the county. And I've already gotten some calls from the city police, I'm sure, and the sheriff himself getting this done. So we'll see that in there. Thank you, sir. That's great. Thank you for all your efforts and all your work on that, Commissioner. I know it's very well, very well. Um, um, I'm reading and talking at the same time. I apologize. <laughs> um, appreciate it by everybody. So thanks so much. And uh, the clerk's office, uh, Madam Clerk, you do need a clarification for the record on AR1. 
Right. So AR1 um, was in regards to the trim notice, and it was additional materials that were filed, and it was um, related to R5, which was passed. So I just want to make sure that it's on the record that AR1 was received as well, since it was on the agenda. That's all. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to me. Um, I do need a motion, if you would, please, to um, reappoint Kelly Mothershead to the Commission of the Status of Women. Her time has expired. She's been doing a great job. She's willing to continue to serve. Awesome. So I move to appoint Kelly. Kelly, yep. Thank you. Okay. Yep. I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey, second by Commissioner Mariano to reappoint Kelly Mothershead to the Commission on the Status for Women. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District one, Commissioner Oakland. Aye. District three, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye, uh, and just for the record, I did pause for Ron to give, give him a chance to make that second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye, <laughs> motion passes, 4-0, thank you. Um, just two quick things, or three quick things. Um, Newport, you mentioned this earlier, Commissioner Newport, Richie CRA boundary change. We mentioned last meeting that in, in advance of the vote, vote, they were going to actually vote on that. It was unanimous, so we thank them for that. Um, again, I just go back to I appreciate um, all the council and the mayor and having conversations with all of them. But I, you know, I do want to say special thanks to Councilman Starkey and City Manager Debbie Manns um, that met with me from the beginning um, and helped really get this ball rolling. I know this has been a discussion all of us have had throughout the years. Um, I do think this does. I don't think it does. It, it does. It does open up the conversation. I think to have with Port Ritchie too. Um, so I will be reaching out to the, and I told him I would <laughs> uh, months ago, but I will reach out to Mayor Tremblay and see if I can set up a meeting and we can have the same discussions, similar discussions that we had with um, um, Councilman Starkey and, the, and, and Ms. Manns. And I know they have, I think, a, a temporary or city manager there now. Um, I'm not correct? Yeah. Yes, so, I did. So they have somebody there. Okay. So gentleman that used to be the um, county minister for Hernando County. Is yeah. there? Yeah. I, I, that sounds I think right. That's it. Yeah. I think that's it. Nice yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Great. Um, just want to um, give a, uh, some kudos to um, Nats, which is the North American Toluca Society. They're um, a group of um, Indian American group that does a lot of great things in the community, um, Pasco County, and the entire Tampa Bay area. Um, they reached out to me and partnered with Nagash Nayak. If you know Nagash, he's big. He does a lot of things in the cricket world around here. Um, they reached out to me, wanted to do some things in the community by delivering meals to our first responders. So we worked together, myself and Andy, and um, the men and women from Nats, and went and provided meals to the Sheriff's Office District 2 headquarters one day, as well as fire stations 36 and 13. So um, a number of their members um, came, helped deliver meals. I guess in his, his um, restaurant called The Local. Um, provide the meals and I want to again thank them and uh, really, really, we appreciate it. I know our uh, first responders appreciated that too. So it was very kind of them. Um, census awareness, um, we are continuing obviously the major push staff is on census awareness. Um, I do want to, I will give a shout out to Commissioner Starkey. I know she's mentioned it in her, in her, um, her um, newsletter as well as um, Representative Maggard has recently too. So it's greatly appreciated. Um, we want to keep the word out there. Um, you know, push, push, push. We'll keep pushing. I know we're, it's a little more difficult now because of what's going on. Plans of going door to door um, have been kind of nixed at this time, um, but hopefully soon they'll be able to start doing that. Again, doing a good job, really, really, really good job. Um, the self-response deadline, I need to mention, has been pushed to October 31st. So the self-response deadline has been pushed to October 31st. And you can still take it online at 2020census.gov, 2020census.gov. For Pasco County, the latest response rate is 62.7%. Again, that's 62.7%. So please encourage everybody to respond to the census because that can mean additional funding or possibly a house seat. You never know for Pasco County, right? Being one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing counties in the state, we can definitely, definitely use any additional funding and assistance. So with that, no, I have an invitation for you. Oh, an invitation uh, for y'all okay. to put on your calendars, Commissioner. Okay. I don't, um, I don't know if I don't think you've received it yet, um, but the first uh, AmSkills boot camp is the 24th, 
Um, I mean, it's going on, and uh, there will be a VIP ceremony oh. uh, on Friday the 24th. It's at True. Um, I think it's at one. I think it's at one o'clock, but I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the time. Um, I, Tom just texted me that you are going to be getting an invitation tonight. Okay. So if you're around, we'd love for you to stop in. Um, and thank you again today uh, when you approve that money from the CDBG uh, or CARES. Um, it's the a, a big chunk of an installment of our own building that will be in Holiday on Darlington. Um, and it'll be, again, another big multi-million dollar investment in uh, the Holiday area which could really use it. So we're really excited about a standalone uh, workforce training center that will help students, citizens, and um, school districts coming in on it. And um, Eckerd, Connect, Eckerd Connects, I guess, and maybe AMI Kids, which is not in Pasco County right now. So could be a really good thing. It will be a very good thing for the county. Great, thank so. you. I think Dan needed to clarify something. I just want to clarify real quick. The CDBG Cares money. money is what is going towards the new facility for AM skills, not the CARES okay, money CDBG. that y'all approved CDBG. today. Yeah, yeah, that's CDBG. for workforce and trained employees oh, or that, people yeah. that were impacted by right. COVID. And so that's I just wanted to clarify that. Camps. Yep. And Commissioner Oakley, we're working on one out in your area, a boot okay. camp. A Thank boot camp's all. coming your way. Oh, that'll be good. We're adjourned. Thank you all. Hey, um, so.